Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third annual APGA Marketing and Communications eConference. My name is Abby Gao, and I am the co-chair of the webinar committee, and I am joined today by my fellow co-chair, Katie Mobley. Throughout the day, we will focus on the importance of brand and culture alignment. In this all-day conference, we'll explore how your brand shapes your culture and how your culture brings your brand to life. You'll hear from the experts on the importance of providing excellent guest experiences and why consistent messaging for both your internal and external audiences is so important. You'll also hear how good storytelling can give your brand depth and personality, which in turn can lead to brand loyalty. Throughout the webinar, if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please share with us in the question section at the bottom of your Zoom panel. And throughout the presentation, feel free to submit questions for the presenters throughout the webinar, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. Now before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to our Communications Community Chair, Nate Kell. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. The Marketing Communications Committee looks forward to bringing you this conference every year. Um, this year's lineup is spectacular. Um, I would like to give a special shout out to Abby and Katie for all their hard work in chairing this e-conference this year. Um, on the next slide, you'll see your hardworking leadership team. Um, this is the team that works behind the scenes all year long, um, ensuring that we get out the educational information, putting on this conference, and then also working on the um, Marketing Communications Committee session at the APGA conference. Um, on the, we did recently have a couple of openings, so I will be sending out an email in a little bit um, to see if anyone would like to participate on the committee. Um, and on this slide, we have the um, American Public Garden Association conference in Portland this year, hoping that you can make it, um, June 22nd through the 26th. Um, a little note for those who are on, the call, are on the webinar today. The Marketing Communications Committee meeting will be on June 25th at 8 a.m. Um, we are still working on the session, so if you have ideas, suggestions, or would like to be a panelist, feel free to let one of us know, and we will make sure to take that information into consideration. So again, thank you, Abby, Katie, and all the presenters today, and a special shout out to Richard, too. Richard, we couldn't do it without you, and take it away, Katie and Abby. Great, thank you so much, Nate. So for our first presentation of the day, we have Rob Alias, Director of Marketing Communications for Tucson Botanical Garden. Rob has over two decades of experience in marketing, operations, and brand management sectors. He has been featured as a guest contributor in a business-focused publication in Southern Arizona where he writes about how organizations can adopt new perspectives on their customer service model. Rob was also named one of Tucson's top 40 business executives under the age of 40 at the age of 26. Rob is a graduate of the University of Arizona as well as the Disney Institute. Rob is currently the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Tucson Botanical Gardens in Tucson, Arizona. So, without further ado, we are proud to welcome Rob Alias. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for allowing me the opportunity to be here and present with you today. Let me get this thing up and running. Everybody can see that okay, I, I presume? I hope, anyway. Yes, you are good, Rob. Perfect, thanks. Well. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk to you about two words that have been, uh, th they've been really buzzwords within this industry for over the past, you know, five to seven years, and that's brand and culture. And really the struggle of how to explain what they really mean, how are, how are they defined, 
what do they feel like when done correctly and incorrectly? And more, more importantly, how they affect your business. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about brand a little bit. Um, most people think brand is, is only marketing. It's, you know, it's, it's something quite simple. Well, yes and no. Marketing certainly is the driver behind creating an expectation of what your guests will see and experience when they visit. However, it's up to the staff and everybody on the staff to deliver on that expectation. If it doesn't happen, uh, it creates an inconsistent guest experience, which translates into a lost opportunity to gain consumer loyalty. And that's really what we're all after. More so, uh, your brand has become now a little bit more dilute. And in this, in this day, with the invention of social media, online reviews, word of mouth uh, being more powerful than ever, this, this one brand or culture misalignment has the ability to cost you so much more than one unhappy guest. So let's take a few, let's take a look at a, at a few brands. Now, every single one of you, when you see a logo on here, has a feeling or a thought or an experience that immediately comes to mind. Um, and what, what was that? Um, it was an experience that you had, or was that an experience that, um, somebody else had that told that they told you about that experience and now that now that becomes by default your experience as well now when, during the creation of all of these companies and i'm sure it still goes on today every one of these companies has had a has had a discussion a meeting to talk about their brand and what they want to be known for how do they make people feel did your thought your initial thought or your experience was that consistent with what you wanted, to, with what they wanted to be known for. So let's ask a couple more questions. What defines a brand? Who decides it? Who controls it? And your brand essentially is what guests think about you. It's your reputation. What the consumer thinks about when they hear your name, use your product, visit your property. That is your brand. You have one, whether you know it or not like it or not, understand it or not, agree with it or not. And if the consumer doesn't have firsthand knowledge of your brand, they will default to what others say about you. And that can be kind of scary. So let's answer some of the, some of the questions posed just a second ago. What defines your, or who defines your brand? And that's the consumer. Who has control over it and what can impact it? Well, you do, your staff does. Every interaction with your guest impacts your, your brand. The words and actions you use and display through all of your platforms, social media, print ads, face-to-face, -face, signage in your, on your properties, the way your property and store and possibly cafe, your exhibits, what do they look like? Everything communicates. Do you have control over it? You absolutely can shape and influence your brand. However, it can be challenging to mold and exponentially more challenging to protect it once you've established what you want. Just out of curiosity, do you know what the number one brand that people in the world that people tattoo on their body? Harley Davidson. And why, why do you think people do this? Um, it's the same reason people put stickers on their cars, water bottles, laptops, etc. Because it says something about who they are and what they believe in. People that do these things are saying that this company and I share values. We believe in the same things. So much so that I'm willing to promote their brand, be an advocate for their brand, and, and give this brand my full and very permanent endorsement. And that's loyalty. So why is that important? Well, as marketers, we are always digging for some sort of insight into the consumer mentality. Um, and that's, that information is absolutely gold to, to marketers. Um, and it's, it's important because with any brand, whatever it may be, regardless of whether we possess the brand or not, proves that people follow, will advocate, will promote, and love what the brand stands for and what it believes in. And not necessarily what the brand produces, creates, makes, builds, or sells. If you're a follower of the thought leader and speaker um, of uh, author Simon Sinek, he puts it simply, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. 
the why explains exactly what your culture is. Brand is what your guests think about you. Culture is what your employees think about you. And that's really the, the main difference. They should absolutely align. Brand is external, culture is internal. Now there are many type, different types of cultures that exist. You can have a friendly culture, a culture of accountability, one that's sales driven, one that's loyalty driven. But just remember whatever your culture is, it stems from leadership and absolutely trickles down to the get to the guest and will impact your battle, your bottom line. And we're going to go over some examples in just a bit, but I, but I pose this question to you, which group of people should be your primary focus, your guests or your employees? How you answer this is very telling about the culture you have today. But first I want to start off with what I feel um, are the basics to create a consistent brand. Now please note, I'm using the word consistent, not good, uh, not good culture or bad culture. Of course, I have my opinions, definitions, and distinction of what makes a good business and what makes a business good. Those two things can be very different. However, the words good for business is always subjective and there are many ways of being good at business. It depends on what you value. So the first thing um, we talked about is um, the why. The why explains where your common purpose is. What are you trying to do collectively? At its simplicity, what are you trying to do? And you should keep this absolutely simple. Number two, shared values. These are the values that everyone within the organization should live by. This spans across every staff member in every position, regardless of the department. And three, the most important one of all, uh, is a commitment to using these things as a filter to ensure the culture is protected. Now, this intersection is really where the magic happens. These aspects should be so well defined that the decisions, challenges, opportunities, new programming, whatever you do within your organization can be tested through the lens of your shared values and common purpose to create a place where brand and culture align. This includes your hiring or selection process, how you vet candidates, how you interview candidates, how you onboard new employees, designing a thorough training process. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in the future, but um, I wanna get that out of the way. And the words that you use with your guests, and not just external, but internal as well. Everything should pass through that lens of shared values and common purpose. What does it look like? So let's look at a couple of examples from some companies that I think do a fairly decent job. There are both household names. Um, and we're just gonna highlight some of the things that they do that protect and preserve the cultures they've built. And one could argue these companies are among the very best in generating consumer loyalty and have what some would call a cult-like following. So let's look at Starbucks. I'm sure quite a few of you have a Starbucks in front of you at this moment. Their common purpose is pretty simple, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. Now, what do you notice about this common purpose? The word coffee doesn't exist in it, which tells you a lot about the culture that they're trying to create. Now, what does talk about coffee is what they consider part of their guiding principle. From the beginning, Starbucks set out to be a different kind of company, one that not only celebrated coffee, but also connection. So this is what they did to try to preserve and protect their, their culture. They set aside a guiding principle, a common purpose, um, and, and shared values that we're gonna go through in the next, uh, next few slides to help protect and preserve the culture that at least Howard Schultz built after, when he purchased the company in, in 1987. So their statement of values that they, they go by. Creating a culture of warmth and belonging where everyone is welcome. Acting with courage, challenging the status quo and finding new ways to grow our company and each other. 
being present, connecting with transparency, dignity, and respect. And finally, delivering our very best in all we do, holding ourselves accountable for results. Now, I was lucky enough, I've been lucky enough to meet Howard Schultz on a couple of, of occasions. The last time happened less than a year ago, and I was able to spend about 30 minutes talking to him about Starbucks and business overall. And I asked him, can you put your finger on one thing that changed the mentality of Starbucks partners that took it from what it was prior to his arrival in 1987 to what it has become, which is the modern Starbucks that we all experience today. And if so, can you share that with me? And he said, absolutely, I'd love to share that with you. Uh, he said, I, I knew what I want a Starbucks to become and we certainly had the ability to make it so. But in order to do that, we had to come up with a way to change the perception of what our purpose was. And what I said was simply this, Starbucks isn't a coffee company that serves people. Starbucks is a people company that serves coffee. Now I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's important. Starbucks isn't a coffee company that serves people. Starbucks is a people company that serves coffee. The mind shift seemed to change overnight. This is what he was telling me. And the partners began immediately, almost immediately to comprehend what they were really trying to accomplish to focus on the connection with each guest. By simply changing the phrase and empowered the partners to begin sharing ideas, new ideas with supervisors, managers, district managers, and Starbucks executives that helped live their values and create a greater connection with their customers. Well, all that sounds really good, doesn't it? But what does it mean? What does it all look like? How do these things help with the alignment to their brand. How are their values implemented with every partner? That's what actually what Starbucks calls their employees partners. And how does it ensure that they, protect the, that they protect the brand and to avoid inconsistent experiences when guests walk, walk through the door? Well, let's explore a different company, another company that does a fairly good job at it. And Disney, uh, I joke when I say fairly decent, but in actuality, Disney was just named one of the most insp inspired, uh, admired companies by Fortune magazine. They have been over many, many years. And there's an enormous responsibility in calling yourself the happiest place on earth. And many of us would cringe at the very thought of being held to that standard. But Disney enthusiastically welcomes it. They do so because they have, con they have confidence in their culture. And let's start by ex uh, exploring what Disney's common purpose is. They create happiness. And that sounds really simple, doesn't it? But Disney, but it's not so simple. Disney wants their cast members to create happiness in the Disney way to ensure that their guest experience is extremely consistent. This is why every cast member must go through what's called traditions, traditions or Disney University before they even make it to the parks. Not only the parks, but even the satellite locations. Cast members at Disney stores must go through the Disney University as well, just to ensure the, the consistency of the brand and culture and make sure that those two things align. It's the lessons taught at traditions that reinforce the culture and what Disney, Disney often calls their culture pixie dust or Disney magic. And that is what makes Disney the happiest place on earth. Now, for those of you that have been to the parks and maybe you've seen this bench or not, this bench is actually sitting inside great moments with Mr. Lincoln just at, just at the entrance. And if you don't know the story about the bench, um, the story is told that Walt Disney had a daddy-daughter day, uh, which was a typical Saturday for them um, at Griffith Park in California. And um, Walt Disney's daughters had a favorite carousel that they liked to, to ride. And Walt Disney was sitting on this bench as his daughters were riding the carousel. When he, when he had the idea of creating, creating Disneyland, and so he went back and he told um, his wife about it. And she, and she said, why would you want to create an amusement park? The only thing that was somewhat similar were like circuses and things of that nature. 
and they all had a reputation of being just absolutely filthy. The, the, the people that worked there were rude and um, just not nice people to deal with. Um, and I say it again, the place was filthy. So, and she said, why would you want to do that? He says, my parks are not going to be dirty. So from that point on, Walt had to develop a culture once he decided to build this theme park to develop a culture that made this possible. And one of the first things that Walt and then the creator of Disney University, his name was Van, uh, Van France, came up with a curriculum and it all stemmed from leadership. So culture stems from leadership. Um, your staff will model what your leadership does. And if your leaders pick up trash, everyone will pick up trash. In the early years, Walt Disney used to speak with every cast member and would tell them, you have two jobs here at Disneyland. Number one, pick up trash. Always make sure the park is clean. And number two, do whatever else you were hired to do. If leadership shows courtesy to their employees, your employees will be friendlier to, to your customers. If your leaders take time, take time to have a little fun, your employees will uh, make it fun for others as well. Just a, a funny side, another uh, side story. In an effort to maintain cleanliness of the park, Walt conducted a study to see how many steps a, a typical guest would carry a piece of garbage before getting tired of carrying it and throwing it on the ground. After months of observation, um, Walt determined that the guests would only carry trash about 35 feet before throwing it on the ground. And that is why to this day, garbage cans at Disneyland are no further than 30 feet apart. Walt said, we're gonna make it so clean that people are going to be embarrassed to throw anything on the ground. And he actually took that a step further. Back in the day, the garbage cans were all you were pretty much one manufacturer. So what Walt did is he created a garbage can, designed a garbage can that where you couldn't see the garbage and you couldn't smell the garbage. So the, the garbage cans that are still used at Disneyland were designed by Walt Disney himself. And this is what happens when culture and brand align. Disney focuses on four main aspects to protect the Disney magic. Number one is selection. If you're wondering how they preserve the culture, the first thing they do is test every potential cast member for culture compatibility versus aptitude of the subject or task. Disney views the recruiting process differently than most. They believe that the basic purpose in recruiting is to find a mutually agreed cultural fit. Now that's very different how, than, than how most of us hire. But think about it this way. When people come to you for a job, they come to you with a pre-existing pre characteristics and they may not match your required or desired behaviors. If you take the time to select the right people, you will get an accelerated performance without diluting your culture. So please pay attention to your job descriptions, how they're worded, your recruiting verbiage, your first contact with a candidate, it all communicates. Treating people like guests during the hiring process is an effective way of demonstrating desired behaviors. Now, remember desired behaviors because that's uh, gonna be a recurring theme that we're gonna be talking about uh, here in the next few slides. A great example um, lies with the characters, uh, with, the, with the character cast members at Disneyland. Would you ever see Cinderella smoking a cigarette in front of the castle? Absolutely not. If their behavior did change based on outside influences, how do you feel that would impact guest satisfaction? This is why selection is so important. Disney hires for attitude and they train for aptitude. Just another side note, that little girl on the, on the right is actually my daughter, so I had, to, I had to give her a shout out. She was excited as when she saw this slide. The next thing that Disney does, uh, number two, is they focus on training. And here's where most companies get it wrong. Companies select and hire people, but then underinvest in the required development that leads to desired behaviors on the job. Again, desired behaviors. Companies simply hope employees will exhibit the desired behaviors once on the job, but hope is not a business strategy. What if you invested time and resources to developing an onboarding process that immersed your new employees in your culture? What if every detail was designed to reinforce the Disney culture? Disney calls this traditions. 
um, and where every detail is absolutely intentional. The picture on this slide are the actual door handles to the building. Going a step further, the building itself is, is painted in an argyle pattern because Walt Disney was known to wear argyle socks. And in case this needed to be reinforced further, there's a picture of Walt Disney just inside the building where you can clearly see his argyle socks. And why does Disney do this? Because they obsess over details. It sets the standard for what's expected from their cast members once they enter the parks and care for their guests. Now the three main aspects that Disney understands by following the pro this process, and here's what they are. It recognizes the proper training leads to desired behaviors. They understand that investing in training an gives, provides an outstanding return on investment. And they know that training creates cast member engagement and commitment, which increases confidence and, co and confidence. And that incre increases productivity and efficiency. The third thing that they talk about is intentional communication. And when Disney says communication, what they mean is listening. Listening is key to their training because it builds relationships and building effective relationships and collaborating with, with, uh, with everyone in your work environment is a key component to success. And not to mention key to fostering a team of people that also collaborates and builds effective relationships. In order to do this, Disney has developed a process of how to intentionally listen as an organization, as leaders, and as peers. And here's, and here's what they do. They listen with a purpose. They deliberately set aside for discussion. They listen to find connections that lead to collaborations and they avoid distractions during this time. They don't get interrupted by phone calls or emails. Number two, and I think this is a really important one. They listen to understand and not to evaluate. I don't know how many of us do this. I'm, I actively try to practice this. I'm getting better at it, but I'm still not, not great at it. Keep your emotions and your personal judgment to yourself when you're having these listening sessions. Practice keeping an open mind and be prepared not to like everything that your employees or colleagues say. Embrace differences of opinions as opportunities to understand on a deeper level. Exercise emotional control. Work to become more self-aware of the phrases, behaviors, and words that trigger your defense mechanisms and recognize that everyone has an opinion, even if that one is different from yours, which happens from time to time. And the last one is they focus on the conversation. Turn off your inner monologue, stop making mental to-do lists, don't look at your watch or your clock, make, on, make eye contact um, when, you're ha when you're having this listening time. Do you know what the most frequently asked question at Disneyland is? When is the three o'clock parade? That's what guests typically ask, ask uh, cast members. Now you can imagine how your employees, our employees would handle such a question. And it's become, it became an irritation uh, to cast members that were brought up during a listening session. And the leader in whatever capacity they were in asked, what do you think the guest is intending to ask? What do you think they really want to know? The cast member then realized what the guest really wanted to know was, what time will the three o'clock parade arrive where I am sitting? Realizing this changed the mentality of the response as well as the response itself. So with that said, this, is, this was the response going forward. The parade will arrive approximately 3.30 if you stay in this location. So you have a little bit more time to enjoy the park between now and then. Just think about how you're how your uh, staff would answer a question like that. And the last thing they focus on is intentional care. And please focus on uh, genuine care. Genuine care must be a strategy that you overmanage. And what does genuine care mean? The kind of care that Disney talks about goes far beyond health, dental, vision, maybe gym memberships, maternity or paternity leave, whatever. Genuine care pretends to be intentional care for the well-being of each person in your organization. 
It is about paying serious attention to employees as human beings. Because caring for your people creates an emotional connection that drives a commitment to goals and overall uh, engagement in your organization. Think about your organization and how it serves its guests and each other. There is a cause and effect relationship here in terms of how care affects behaviors. And please remember the ultimate goal is to achieve desired behaviors. Providing genuine care to your people is another way to create a nurtured desired behavior. This is why care needs to be a strategy. When much is required, much should be given. One of my favorite uh, Disneyland stories that speaks to intentional care when it pertains to a guest interaction was told to me many, many years ago by, uh, by a lady, she was a grandmother uh, that I used to work with. Her name was Kathy Lou. At the time, Kathy Lou was the grandmother of four, uh, four beautiful little girls and her favorite Disney character is Tinkerbell. Her granddaughters had never been to Disneyland, let alone met Tinkerbell. So it was time to take the family to Disneyland so her granddaughters could meet Tinkerbell. They enter the park and they make their way to Pixie Hollow. For those of you that haven't been there, um, you're standing along uh, among these large leaves. So you can see them there in the background. Um, and you kind of winding your way around to, pro to provide a type of drama, this, dr this dramatic anxiousness to seeing Tinkerbell. They wait in line for about 10 minutes before they turn the corner and there she is. Her granddaughters go up to the Tinkerbell uh, and they give her a big hug because they've heard so much about her. After they get their pictures, Kathy Lou takes a second to walk up to Tinkerbell and says, you probably don't remember me, but we met many years ago. Tinkerbell squints in her eyes and gazes into Kathy Lou's eyes and with a look of amazement, she gently places her hand on Kathy Lou's arm and says, I remember you. It's so lovely to see you again after all these years. Do you think Tinkerbell's interaction with Kathy Lou would have been different if she didn't feel cared for or if she was a disengaged employee? How can we build care into a strategy? How can we operationalize it? You can do so when you practice intentional listening Ask your employees what frustrates them most. What's a hassle in their day-to-day -day routine? People feel cared for and behave differently when you make their life easier, when you remove workplace irritations. This does two things. It engages, it engages your people to delivering extraordinary performance. And two, it enables your people to focus more on performing in their role, no matter what capacity they're working in. This is applicable to everyone. It affects behavior and performance. What are the hassles and irritations in your organization today? How many of them could you repair immediately if you wanted to? How would you view the cost benefit ratio when viewed through the business lens? Remember, you are making investments in your customer service as well as in your people. The, bo the bottom line is people who are cared for act differently. Now I made the statement at the beginning of the, of the Disney segment that referred, that, that referenced the weight that comes to being known as the happiest place on earth. All I have referenced in this presentation and a lot I didn't mention is why Disney enthusiastically welcomes the challenge. Every opportunity to reinforce the culture is taken into consideration. Even at the graduation ceremony for cast members, it's no different. At the end of traditions, Disney does a couple important things that solidifies the importance of preserving the culture. Mickey Mouse himself presents each new cast member with their cast member badge. And number two, the final statement is made before the new cast members enter the park the following day. Tonight, there will be thousands of little boys and girls that won't be able to sleep because tomorrow they get to come to Disneyland. Are you ready for that? Let's talk about one more company very briefly that is, it is known um, to have their brand and culture aligned. The Ritz Carlton. They've adopted a number of tools that help them stay true to who they are and more importantly, 
to protect the brands they've worked so hard, the brand they've worked so hard to create. They've developed gold standards, which encompasses the following. They have a credo, the Ritz Carlton, the place where the genuine, where the genuine care and comfort of our guests is, is our highest mission. They developed a motto. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. They developed three steps of service, a warm, sincere greeting. Number two is use the guest's name, anticipation and fulfillment of, of each guest needs. Number three is a fond farewell. Give a warm goodbye and use the guest's name. They developed service of values. I'm proud to be Ritz Carlton and on and on and on. I won't read them all to you because you can look them up for yourself. But the most incredible thing the Ritz Carlton does on how they take care of their of their employees, which in turn helps them take care of their guests. They empower and encourage employees and they have a $2,000 a day budget to use for guests at their discretion. It's a tool to empower and encourage employees to use their time, effort, and when needed, the company's money to enhance the experience of any guest even a guest who is already having a great time. It's an approach that is not just about solving problems, but finding opportunities. And there's a great, there's a great uh, story that will help drive this home. So a mom uh, realized that her two-year-old son had lost his favorite Thomas the toy when they were packing up to head to the airport. She mentioned this to a Ritz Carlton employee that the loss, the loss of the toy would be heartbreaking for him. After searching for the toy, the employees, knowing how important the train was, they drove to a toy store and bought another Thomas, uh, Thomas the train for him. They then took the train around the property, around the, the resort, taking pictures of Thomas by the pool. You'll see him here by the entrance of the resort um, at, at the restaurant. And they put a little note um, with, the, with the pictures and the toy after they sent it back to the little boy and they said, Thomas had such a great time here. He wanted to, he, he wanted to extend his vacation just, just a few days. The new Thomas train arrived in the mail four days later and the family was blown away and they shared the story at every chance they got proclaiming that Ritz Carlton has, has earned their business for years to come. How, what can you do in your business that would, there's something similar to this. Why does it matter? Why should you spend time, money, and other resources making sure that the brand and culture align? Because when your brand and culture align, it creates something magical. It creates an emotional connection. And this is what every business should, should aspire to achieve. In a published article, um, in Inc, uh, on Inc.com in 2018, a Harvard professor stated, sorry, that picture is there to drive home, drive home the point, stated that 95% of all purchasing decisions are based on emotion. 95%. Why is that? It's because humans are driven by feelings. So if you want the consumer to remember you, your product, your brand, they must feel emotionally connected to what you have done, and more importantly, why you do what you do. It doesn't matter whether it's Starbucks, Disney, Ritz Carlton, or the Tucson Botanical Gardens. It is vital to any business to create an emotional connection with their customers. Once you're able to earn hearts, you'll begin to earn wallets. Now I say that with a caveat of please do not focus on the wallets, focus on the hearts, and the wallet will be a byproduct of creating happiness. What do these companies do that make them so different? What makes them attract a cult-like following? They live their values. And most companies proudly place their brand statements, values, missions, mission vision statements on the wall of their business, but they quickly become meaningless words on a wall that no one looks at or pays attention to. These are the things that must be focused on. They must be built in the strategy of every event, plan, sign, design, interaction with a guest throughout the organization. 
So what are the lessons that you've learned today? Um, please develop a common purpose and shared values that you actually believe in and please live by them. Don't just come up with words because they sound good or because others in the business use them. They must be yours. Companies don't have values. People that work within them do. So do whatever you can to take care of the people you work with. They are the ones who will protect and preserve your brand and culture. They will make or break your business. I really want to sincerely thank you for your time uh, and attention today. It's been a privilege to talk to you about this topic. I'm obviously very passionate about and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have now or in the future. You can, um, you can email me um, with, at the email address there. And to take this a step further, because I want to, uh, I want to show genuine care, um, the first three people that email me and tell me three things they will now start doing that display care for, other, for others will earn a $20 Starbucks gift card. So the first three people that email me and tell me how, what you will now start doing that will display care for others, you'll earn a, a $20 Starbucks gift card. So with that said, I'll turn it back over to you guys and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, what a great kickoff to the day. And what's, um, you know, great examples of the importance of brand and culture alignment and I think we all have some marching orders that we can start utilizing as soon as today. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, okay, we are going to get right into the questions. Um, Angel Horn says, if we have a lack of diversity in our leadership, how can we genuinely embrace, create a brand that makes everyone feel welcome? And, that, and that's, um, not a unique problem that a lot of organizations, not just in our industry, but in other industries face. The best thing that we can do is in a politically correct way, call it out. Um, really um, emphasize with your supervisors, with your uh, administrators, with your executives, how the decisions that, the, how the decisions that are made are impacting business in a negative way and how changes to some of these decisions can impact the business in a positive way. The only time things ever change is when the risk of staying the same, oh, I'm sorry, the risk of change is greater than the risk of staying the same. So if you are if you're able to eloquently describe the changes that somebody suggests or the changes that um, whatever it may be in whatever um, avenue they want to change, how those changes will impact the bottom line in a positive manner, and not just the bottom line, but even culturally, whether it be through um, higher employee satisfaction or higher employee engagement, those things absolutely need, need to be um, called out in a way without getting yourself in trouble. Great, some good points there, Rob. Um, just a reminder to everyone um, that we will be providing a recording of the e-conference in a follow-up email in the next few days. I know there was a lot of great information and I'm sure you're all anxious um, to share with the rest of your teams, um, so be on the lookout for that email. Um, our next question comes from Lee Clippers. Lee says, how does a common purpose differ from a mission? So a, a common purpose um, is something that is so simple. Um, you know, you take a look at Disney's, for example, create happiness. That's not Disney's mission. Their mission can be something about um, being the number one entertainment company in the world. I'm just making that up. I'm not saying that that's, that that's theirs. Um, you know, a, a common purpose could be something, say you, you work for an airline company. The one common purpose, the one non-negotiable is to get your passengers to their destination safely. As it talks nothing about um, providing a return on investment to your shareholders or ensuring uh, board member satisfaction or any of, any of that nature. In its simplicity, what are you trying to do? 
Disney's is two words, create happiness. So it's not meant to be this eloquent um, thing that everybody um, publicly looks at or can publicly see. It's not something that you're designed to put on the wall of your, of your buildings. It's designed to be an internal North Star where at its simplicity, this is what we're trying to do here as a staff, as an organization to provide happiness for our guests. Um, so, so those are um, on a very high level what the difference is between the two. Great, sounds good. Um, Rob, how do you see culture and brand alignment shifting in the next 10 years? Well, I hope to see a huge shift in it and, and a much more apparent um, designed structure around making sure the two align. You know, we, I mentioned earlier that, that brand and culture have been two buzzwords that have been used in the industry, but nobody really knows what that means or what they can do about it or how they can change it, how they can alter it. Um, and so there's like, people think that, oh, we have a fantastic culture because we allow our employees to wear jeans on Fridays or we have potlucks every quarter. And I'm not saying those things are bad. Those things are fantastic. But there's so much more that goes into creating the culture that you want. And, and again, I, I want to use the word consistent culture, not good culture, bad culture, because some companies value things differently. Others will just rely um, only on profit. What does our bottom line look like? Um, what does our bonus structure look like? And that's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Um, the, the focuses are different. So I think that over the next 10 years, I hope that there will be a, an effort to really pay attention to what the culture is Within, a, within an organization, and it seems to me that a younger demographic, a, a younger workforce, seem to really understand more, in my experience, what a true culture should be. I, I, I just think that the perceptions are different. Um, it's, you know, gone are the days where people kind of stay in a job for 35 years or 40 years and end up retiring there. You see a lot of movements uh, within a younger generation uh, because they want to see their efforts work quicker. So um, I think as the younger generation moves up in, in greater management positions, I think the changes within cultures will inherently change because it seems like there's more attention paid to it. Great. It sounds like you have a positive outlook for our generation. So that's really <laughs> good. Um, Patty Wales says, what is the common purpose at Tucson Botanic? You know, that's something that we are actively working on now. Um, that's, it's, uh, we have a very good mission statement and, I, and, and I've only been here at the gardens for a little bit less than two years. And we have a phenomenal executive director that really understands um, what we're trying to do here. And she has a great um, relationship with, with every, with, with every um, employee that we have here. So what we're trying to determine, and it's, it's through her listening sessions, where we're trying to determine what is, our, what is our common purpose, what are our shared values. And the things I talk about are things that we're actually in the middle of right now. We're trying to talk about things like you know, what, how do we describe the, the, the company culture? How do we describe what our common purpose is, what our shared values are, and start thinking about, um, start talking more about the things that we believe in rather than what we do. And when we start to do those things, we'll start to attract people and people that believe in the same things that we do. Great. And um, this might be giving away some of the answers for your um, <laughs> little contest you have going on. Um, but what are um, some things that smaller gardens can do um, to apply these practices on a smaller scale? You know, it's, I think it's actually easier for smaller organizations to adopt these, some of these um, processes. 
because you have probably you have fewer staff and Tucson Botanical Gardens is we consider a small organization. We, you know, we're a five and a half acre garden. Um, we have, um, I believe 20 some uh, employees. So we're not a large garden. And it, I think it's gonna be easier for us to make some of those changes um, to adopt some of these practices um, so it, it, the process really doesn't change regardless of what size you are. The, time, the, the amount of time it takes to adopt pro, uh, these processes and practices will take more time because you have to filter through more employees. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't matter the size of, of your business or the size of your garden um, in order to adopt these practices. The only thing that will change is the amount of time it takes to adopt them, to practice them. Great, and that totally makes sense. And you know, definitely seems more digestible for a smaller garden to um, apply these practices. You know, even if they aren't, you know, a large institution like Disney um, right. or the Rich Carlton. Right. Well, and and one of the things that Disney did that was um, so smart is they started so early. I mean, they started in 1955, and they were starting um, uh, the traditions program before the park even opened. So it was probably pretty, it's probably easier for them. Now, over the years, when they're hiring 300, 300 people for a summer job, then it becomes, then, then uh, the process becomes a little bit more, more time consuming, but that's when they pay extra special attention um, to really architect and make sure that every new cast member understands what the culture is in order to preserve what that is. Great, and thank you again, Rob, um, for kicking us off today. Um, My pleasure. And thank you. I also want to thank you for um, you know bringing this topic to us. Um, you are very well informed, so um, thank you for bringing this topic to us and for kicking us off. And um, everyone, be sure to jot down um, Rob's email there and be sure to um, submit um, your ideas for how to implement some of these practices. And we will be taking a short break. And when we come back, we will um, hear from uh, Mindy Bianca, uh, principal at MBPR. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for spending the day with your marketing and communications community with APGA. Our next pre presentation um, is by Mindy Bianca, principal at MBPR. And she will be presenting insights into how to grow your PR program. Mindy began her career as a print journalist with an interest in feature writing and a particular passion for writing about travel. Shifting to a public relations career in late 1994 on what was supposed to be a temporary basis turned out to be a perfect, permanent fit. Over the past 22 years, Mindy has shared fascinating stories of destinations and travel-related businesses from all over the world. Now she runs her own PR agency focused on media relations for destinations and tourism-related businesses. So, without further ado, please welcome Mindy Bianca. Good morning, everyone. Oh, and here I'm trying to share my screen, and that's not working. So we might have the, the gang at Longwood Gardens pull up my presentation. Hold on. <laughs> here we go. Got it. <laughs> okay. So good morning to everybody. I think I might be the, the speaker today who is uh, not an employee of a public garden, but I am a user of public gardens. Um, 
my parents are both avid gardeners, and from the time I was a very small child, every vacation always included a stop at a garden if there was one nearby. So on behalf of my entire family, thank you for giving us excellent experiences and some great travel memories over the years, and inspiring my mom, who after sending two kids to college, um, went back to college herself and got her degree in landscape architecture so that she could really do up a garden the right way. So. Um, so thank you on, on, on behalf of your visitors for delivering excellent experiences. Um, so you got a little bit of background on me, um, and, and just think, I, I know that all of you have many, many things on your plate, many different, you wear different hats, you do a lot of different things. A lot of you probably are dabbling in marketing as well as public relations, as well as social media. Um, and as was said in my introduction, I pretty much devote myself 100% of the time just to media relations. So my entire job is spending time talking to journalists, trying to encourage them to cover stories about our clients, um, and kind of getting to know where they are, what's going on in the world of journalism these days. And of course, my background as a journalist helps me in that way um, to have those very real conversations. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to give you guys some insight. You certainly know the basics of public relations, but I hope that I'm able to give you some insight into, in 2020, how can we be making those media relationships work the very best advantage um, to all of us. So if I had to boil it down to everything that I know about public relations and share it in just one sentence, it would be this. Your mom was right about absolutely everything. And I say this sort of in jest, but it's also incredibly true. If you take the basics of public relations and boil them down, it's really the rules that your parents taught you when you were a kid, how to behave. Um, you know, mind your manners and be polite. Sometimes the media can be really annoying, and sometimes they can be brutal. Sometimes they can be very negative, and the, you, you just have to kind of smile and nod and be as polite as you can be and muddle through. Um, say please and thank you. Um, if somebody does a great story for you, say thank you. If you want someone to come out and, and cover something in your garden, make sure you're, you're saying please. Extend a polite invitation. Um, play nicely with others. Be a good partner to other attractions in your community. Be a good partner to your local convention and visitors bureau or your state tourism office. Um, reach out to the new kid in class and say hello. If you see that there's a new journalist working at the local TV station or a new person joins the morning show at a local radio station or maybe there's a new reporter who's covering the, the calendar section of your newspaper or local magazine, reach out, say hello, introduce yourself, be friendly. Uh, if someone asks you for something, fulfill your promise. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And perhaps most importantly, don't be selfish. Share. And um, we'll talk about that in a little while. It's not all about you. And the more you're willing to share the spotlight with others, probably the more likely you are to get some great PR. So those are just some of the rules of the road. Let's talk about where things are in the world of the media landscape right now. Um, things are kind of grim, if we're being honest. Um, as a former journalist, it makes me very sad to see what's happening in journalism today. I'm very old school. I'm a person who loves to hear the funk of a newspaper hit my front doorstep in the morning. I'm a person who enjoys carrying around magazines and reading them. Um, I am a very, like, I, I just, I, I like to hold on to things as I'm, as I'm reading them and digesting them. I know that that's not how modern people do things. Everybody does everything online and digitally now. And that's being reflected in the way that magazines and newspapers are being run. So it's harder and harder to find outlets to share your story because a lot of the outlets have just changed dramatically in the past few years. Every form of media is going through significant changes right now. And those changes impact all of us as, as marketing and public relations professionals. So we have to know how to adapt and change with the times and work with and engage the, the media as it's working today. In the last 18 months, a lot of titles of publications that I really love to work with, all these guys pictured on the right side of the screen, those folks have either gone out of business or they've gone to online only outlets. And if you look at the left side of your screen, that's how people are digesting 
their media information these days. Um, and, and it's a different kind of way that you have to pitch these folks. Uh, the speed at which you have to get to them is very different. So what do we need to do? Um, my, my general theory is you have to pay attention to the seasons and know that different kinds of media work in different kinds of seasons. So you've got television, you've got radio, you've got newspapers, you've got magazines, you've got digital media, you have social media. Um, honestly, as the, the way that we all work, we have to kind of speak all those different languages. It's almost like we have to be multilingual and communicate with each type of media the way they need to be communicated with. And that can be really hard and a little overwhelming because we only have so many hours in the day. And each and every journalist wants you to, to approach them as if they're the only journalist that you're ever approaching. In my case, we approach thousands and thousands of journalists every year. And so we really try very hard to figure out what is everyone's particular need, how do they need to be communicated with, um, how do we treat them as individuals while also doing our jobs and eventually you know, shutting down shop for the night and going home. So for print publications, for magazines, and even to some degree newspapers, but particularly let's think about magazines like your local lifestyle magazine, your local city magazine, or you know, if you have your, sets, uh, your site set on something really big like you know, a, a monthly periodical like Better Homes and Gardens or something like that, for that kind of publication, Stories these days have a longer shelf life. They have to be what we call evergreen. They have to be a story that lasts over and over and over again that doesn't really have um, a, an end date to it. So when you are pitching those kinds of outlets, you have to be thinking long term. And you have to maybe give up on the idea of having perhaps you have a special event um, and you really aspire to have that event that maybe takes place for a month or three weeks in one of these, these long lead outlets, they may not be very interested anymore simply because they're going much more toward these evergreen, long-lasting stories. If you do have an event, if you do have something short-term, the place where that can go is the digital side of things. And you know, a lot of those publications, a lot of those long lead glossy magazines that probably were the perfect place for your gardens a few years ago, mainly because you had great photography and they really, really took advantage of great photography, um, a lot of those publications now have a digital side. And that is probably where you should be pitching things like events and anything with kind of a shorter lead. Um, and, and often you, you might think that it's the same staff doing the print edition and the digital. It's actually in most cases two different staffs. You might think, well, they're under the same banner. Clearly they're talking to each other. Actually, they're often not. So just because you went to one side, the, you know, like the print side of a publication with a story idea, doesn't mean that the digital side knows about it. So in some cases, you may have to be pitching to two different people at an outlet with the same name because they may not even be in the same office building. They may not even be in an office. These days virtually you know, tons of media just work remotely. They work from their homes. And so they're not even in the same office space as people to just over lunch or passing through the office share an idea. Digital stories are going to be quicker to produce, but journalists don't spend a lot of time on them. It is like a never-ending cycle for them. As soon as they file one story, their editor is throwing another story at them. So a couple things happen with these short lead public, uh, publications or, or websites. One thing is, unfortunately, there's not always as much accuracy as you would like. And that's really challenging for us as public relations and marketing professionals because we, we are so concerned about making sure that anything that is consumer facing is accurate. We want to make sure people know what the ticket price is. We want to make sure we, people know which hours things are happening. And a lot of times those things get mixed up or messed up in a digital story. The good news is that they're pretty easy to fix digitally. And so if you can go to the journalist or the editor in a very polite way and just basically without kind of being persnickety to them, obviously you want the information to be correct, but if you remind them they also want the information to be correct, usually they'll change those things for you. But what I'm finding is increasingly the more work you can do for a journalist, the better off everyone's going to be. And I'm not suggesting that journalists have become lazy or incompetent, anything but. They are overwhelmed and overworked and constantly being, you know, just things are being thrown at them left and right. So I really try to formulate as specific as information as I can give them 
so they have all the details they need. I also respond to a lot of leads and queries all day, every day. My team is just looking out there for who's looking for what kind of story. And so uh, a lot of times we'll give them, you know, you, it's this fine line. You want to give them comprehensive information, but you don't want to give them so, inf so much information that you bore them or that you, they, just, they, they just disconnect. They're like, you know, I, I don't have time. You know, think about your attention span when you're online. Think about the average attention span. It's not very long, so you don't want to inundate people with a lot of information, but you do want to give them enough information and more than your competition so that if they're choosing between you and something else, that they don't have to go back to you to ask for more details. They don't have to go to you to ask for, for photos. That you've kind of given that to them all in one place and that you've provided the information so that you know it's accurate. Um, so just remember, no one has an attention span anymore. So you've got to make your pitches very snappy, very creative, quick and fun. Um, I discovered, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very verbose person. I love a paragraph. Paragraphs don't work for the media. Bullet points work. So if you're trying to get a point across and you're sending an email, rather than doing it in, in, you know, in sentences and paragraphs, consider just doing a quick introduction sentence. Here's who I am. Here's who I represent. This is what I wanted to tell you about. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Here's a link to photos. Please let me know if you have questions. Um, you know, the quicker someone can get through your email and decide whether it's helpful to them or not, the more likely they are to use it if it is indeed helpful. So you know, our worlds as, as public relations practitioners, as marketers, as people who are working with the media and hoping that the media will help us share our stories, they become really, really difficult. Um, you can just see from these headlines, I mean, what is happening? Who is left to pitch? Who is left to share your stories with? Well, there are plenty of people. Um, probably a lot of them are former editors, people who were let go from all of these magazines that have closed. And I say that sort of in jest, but it's very true. I mean, I am, of course, friends with a lot of editors that I have known for more than two decades who in the past couple of years, their, their magazines have been shut down or they've gone strictly digital. Those people have now become freelancers. And they're very desirable freelancers because they know how to write, they know how to edit, their work comes across pretty clean to whoever it is they're writing for. So a lot of what used to be editors or editorial staff have torn, turned into freelancers. And so my suggestion would be a freelancer could be your best bet. These are folks who have a lot more flexibility than somebody who's on staff. Somebody who's on staff at a newspaper, magazine, or even a TV station may not be able to leave the office and get to you. But a freelancer probably can. Um, so you can actually have personal interaction with a freelancer. And many of them will, will figure out a way to tell your story. You know, freelancers are, are hungry. They need to eat. They need to be paid. So they're going to come out and they're going to spend time and they're going to try to get to a really great story with you because it's in their best interest as well because they want to sell that story to an outlet. So I'm, I'm just going to suggest that maybe you do a Google search on freelance journalists in your town or your city and see who's out there and see if maybe they have an interest in coming out and seeing you and, and if some of the outlets that they write for could be appropriate outlets for you all to be approaching. Uh, you know, it's, it's also not unheard of that there could be a freelancer in your backyard who writes stories for a national outlet. Uh, I used to be the PR person for the state of Maryland's tourism office, and I knew all the freelancers based in Baltimore because I knew that if I had a story that I needed to get to a national publication really fast, the best way to do it was going to be call one of my local freelancers. And they were close, so I didn't have to put them up overnight. I, there was not a whole lot I had to do for them except for show them where the story was and make sure that they, they had what they needed to tell it. So I would really recommend trying to see if you can find freelancers in your local area who might have an interest in you. Um, I'll also say a lot of people, both freelancers and editorial staff, are going to write a story without ever visiting. And as a person who works in the travel industry, I, that's really hard for me. I'm a big believer in seeing is believing. I think that the very best stories come from people who have had personal experiences, who have been out there to see how, how your guests are you know, having experience at, at your facility. But sadly, a lot of people just don't have the time or the, the, the budget to get there. Um, so we're having to, our, our jobs are even harder sometimes 
because we are trying to get people to help us tell our stories when they don't even know what our stories are. So we're really responsible for trying to educate them about things. And this is where things like a really great website or really awesome press materials pay off because if someone can't physically come out and see you, at least you can give them fulfillment pieces that hopefully will help tell your story in the best possible way. So how do we figure out where your story belongs? Um, you know, you have to kind of survey the media. And you, know, you look at this photo on the right and look at all of those magazines. I've sort of painted a grim picture of what's going on in journalism, but that's not to say that there aren't a bunch of magazines out there still. There aren't a bunch of newspapers out there still. There's tons of websites. There's all kinds of television programs. People need content. So it's kind of our job to figure out, we're like matchmakers. We know we have a story. We have to figure out who's the best person to tell that story, what's the best outlet to share that story. And so you kind of have to do your research. Um, we, on, on our staff, we have two people. Their entire jobs are research. Um, let's say, for example, we have a client who, well, uh, one that's coming up right, right in a couple of weeks is Valentine's Day. So we have clients who are like, hey, we have Valentine's Day packages. Get these out there. So our researchers go out online and they look to see, okay, which, which outlets are talking about Valentine's Day deals and travel? Um, which outlets have, have written about Valentine's Day travel in the past? Um, and they not only pull the story, they read the story and they say who else has been included in it. Um, because if they were included last year, there's a good chance they'll be included again, but sometimes the media wants to change things up and they don't want to include the same folks again. Um, we also dig through who's the journalist who wrote this story. Do we know this journalist? If we don't know this journalist, let's reach out and introduce ourselves to that journalist. So there's a lot of research involved, and I, I know how busy all of you are. And when do you have the time to do that research? It's really, really hard to find the time. But if you have a message that you think is really important, I urge you to do a little research and figure out the top outlets that will help you tell that story. Um, and before you pitch it to somebody, again, do your research and make sure that they haven't covered you recently. Um, and that sounds kind of silly because you're thinking, well, I'm kind of in charge of the message, so wouldn't I know if they covered us or not? But I have one client who consistently comes to me and says, oh, we really need to be in this outlet or we really need to be on that TV show. And I learned very early on in that relationship with that client, I had to do my research because it happened to me twice where I went to a journalist and said, I have a perfect story for you. And they sent a note back and said, well, it is perfect. That's why I told that story last year. And I had to go back to the client and say, well, wait, if they told the story already, why are you asking me to go to them again? Oh, well, we thought it was time for people to know about us again. Well, on a national news outlet, they're not going to tell the same story twice in 12 months. That's just not going to happen. So make sure that you take that extra step to be positive that the person you're approaching or the outlet you're approaching hasn't recently written about you or hasn't recently talked about you on the air. You also want to figure out who is the best contact to connect with. Who seems like they would be friendly to my cause? And so, for example, let's say you want a local TV station to come out and spend some time at your garden. So, you know, maybe listen to the anchors chatter. You know, sometimes they'll talk about what they did over the weekend. Did somebody mention that they spent their weekend in the garden? If so, maybe they are into gardening, and maybe they would be a person to approach. Um, you know, do you ever hear a reporter mention something about their kids? If they have kids and you've got a great children's program, maybe that's going to be a friendly audience. So you kind of want to study the media and figure out who's the right person for me to connect with. Um, so here's another example. You, you also want to know who not to connect with. And for example, in my career, I've worked with a lot of zoos and aquariums. And those zoos and aquariums are very popular with a lot of family-oriented journalists. There are a lot of people who are opposed to zoos and aquariums. And so we have gotten in the habit in our department, we always look at people's social media feeds. We see you know, if, if they are Facebook friends with PETA, we're probably not going to invite them to the big event at the zoo or the aquarium because we don't want to upset the apple cart. We don't want to offend anyone. So we just try to take those extra steps so that we know that we're getting to the right person. So that extra minute of research you do could be the building block for your future. And I will say, once you've figured out who you think the right person is, no matter how high ranking they might be, be fearless. Just reach out, say hello, introduce yourself, say hello. Um, I did this 
several months ago with Craig Melvin, who is one of the anchors of the Today Show. Um, he is from South Carolina. I have a lot of clients in South Carolina. He talks about South Carolina at least once a week on the air. He is passionate about his home state. Um, I saw an interview with him in Garden and Gun magazine. And in that interview, which was only two pages, I think he mentioned South Carolina five times. So I just reached out and sent him an email, and I said, hey, you know, love everything you're doing on the Today Show. Also saw your interview in Garden and Gun and just wanted to let you know how much the people of South Carolina appreciate how much love you have for that state. You know, I represent some of the littlest, tiniest districts in South Carolina, and it's really meaningful for them to hear you say loving things about their state when you're on the air. And he sent back the most lovely note and was just very kind and very thoughtful. And he said, hey, you know, anytime you need something for those clients in South Carolina, you let me know. And I didn't have a need for him right then. Like, I'm not going to cash in that ship immediately. But when the time does come to cash in that ship, I will find that email, recycle it with him, remind him who I was, and see if he indeed can be helpful to those clients. So if you think you've figured out the right person to talk to, go ahead and start the conversation. Be brave. You'll be surprised often by the response you get. So let's say you have figured out who the person is and you want to kind of create this relationship. Uh, and remember, you're looking for long-term relationships with the media. You want to um, – th this is not going to be quick overnight. This is going to be something that takes place over time. I will tell you my general theory on, on reaching out to strangers who are in the media who you think could be someone that you might want to work with in the future. Flattery can get you everywhere. Sending them a note after you've seen a story they've done on television or you've heard them interviewed on the radio or you've, you've read a piece online or in the newspaper or magazine, reach out and say, you know, that piece was really impressive. I, I really liked it. It really spoke to me. Take a look at recent projects they've been involved with, and if the mood strikes you, compliment them. Now, I want to give you this caveat. You have to be genuine in your outreach. The, the media can, can smell BS a mile away. Do not be disingenuous. Do not be insincere. Don't say something just because you're hoping to get a response from them. You have to be genuine. And I find it's often easiest to do this when you have nothing to gain, when you're, you literally have just seen something that you like and you're just telling them that you like it. And that could be the way to establish a relationship. As a former journalist, I can tell you I did not get a lot of positive feedback, both you know, from my editor and from the general public. Um, so when I got positive feedback, I certainly sat up and took notice. In fact, I haven't been a newspaper reporter for 25 years. I still have a folder of what I call my happy grams, um, notes and letters that people sent me when a story really, really impacted them. When I told a story and it made them cry, or I told a story and it made them sit up and take notice and do something. I love those letters, and getting that feedback was so, so important to me. And so I know that journalists very rarely hear the positives so when you take a minute to compliment somebody's work and tell them, hey, nice job, it's probably something they haven't heard from anyone but their friends in a long, long time. And so it can be really meaningful. So I'm going to give you an example of how this really paid off for me. Um, I, up until a couple months ago, subscribed to National Geographic Traveler. I can no longer subscribe because it's no longer a print edition. Now I get it online. But um, I used to get the print copy of the magazine, and I would carry it around with me, and I'd read it on airplanes, and wherever I was, I just loved reading the magazine. And several years ago, I saw a story about um, a special kind of brownie that they have in British Columbia, Canada. And the story, I mean, I'd had a brownie like that when I had been in Canada, and I loved it. But this little blurb in National Geographic Traveler. It was written with humor and it was written with passion. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is simultaneously funny. And also, I think I'm going to talk to my husband tonight about booking flights to British Columbia so we can have an experience there and make sure we eat one of these brownies. And so I reached out to the journalist and I said, you know, your story just really struck a chord with me. It was funny. It was passionate. It was, I, you wrote a love letter to a brownie and I, you're my people. And there was, I, I had no reason to reach out to her other than to say, I loved your story. 
And she sent a note back, and we started to talk. And she was like, oh, you know, I see in your email address you run a public relations company. So we got to know each other. She asked me who clients were. Uh, we talked about the funny things you eat when you're traveling. And a few months later, I had the opportunity to coordinate a press trip to Norway. And I sent her a note, and I said, so I remember you say you like to eat local cuisine and interesting weird things. How do you feel about reindeer stew? And she sent a note back, and she was like, I'm in. When are we going? And so then we started to travel together. And over the course of time, we forged a really lovely partnership and a great friendship. And it has led to her coming to some client destinations of mine that I don't think she ever would have considered going to. But she trusts me now. She knows I'm not going to steer in the wrong direction. And she has great experiences in our destinations. She has won one of the biggest travel journalist awards ever for writing about one of our destinations, which certainly made our destination happy, but also you know, made us happy for her. So we've created this bond. And it all started over a story about a dessert in British Columbia. And you know, there was nothing for me to gain in that conversation that day. But think about all the things I've gained over the years. So I will say, you know, when you've established a relationship, once you have their ear, check in with them occasionally. Don't waste their time. Don't just check in with them and waste their time, but check in with them every now and then and just say hello. And maybe you do have something that you want to talk to them about. You know, hey, I just wanted to put this on your radar screen. I know you have kids. We're starting this new kids program. I would love for you to come out as my guest, um, have the experience. Uh, you know, please let me know if that's something that's interesting to you. Just try to remember to continue that conversation. And it's, you always have to straddle that line. You don't want to be annoying, but you want to be helpful and friendly. So we've probably all heard the, you know, the concept of the elevator speech where you have to be able to encapsulate your message in a couple of sentences. The, you know, for the length of an elevator ride, how do you sum up whatever it is you're trying to say? So you have to get your pitch down to a few sentences that you can fire off at a moment's notice. And we actually do this in my, in my team. We, you know, we practice with each other. We've got 21 clients, so we practice with each other. Okay, quick, elevator speech for Cooperstown, New York. Elevator speech for the Space Needle. Like, what, what are we saying? And so you kind of have to practice it so that you've got it down to a science. And for you, it might, just, it might be you've got an elevator speech for your facility as a whole. You've got an elevator speech maybe for a new exhibit or something new that's happening. You have an elevator speech for a certain kind of programming that you do. Maybe you have an elevator speech about the special people who work with you. Maybe you have an elevator speech about the kinds of guests you attract. But have those things down to you know, the bare couple of sentences because you don't know when you're going to run into a journalist or somebody else that is going to need to process that information in that way. I'm going to advise you to think like a journalist when you are planting these seeds. Journalists are told and they're trained from the very beginning, you are to answer the questions who, what, when, where, why, how, and not listed on this street post sign here, how much. Quantity, numbers, those really, really matter to the media. So make sure that you're answering those questions in your pitch. Have that information handy. Who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much. And speaking of how much, the lesson for all of us to take away is less is more. Don't overwhelm them with details. Keep things very short and sweet, whether you are on the phone with them, whether you're in person with them, whether you're sending them an email, whether you're tweeting them, whatever it is you're doing, keep it short and sweet. And you know, we as humans, I think, have a tendency when we're telling a story, we want to lead up to the big news. We want to lay the foundation, and then we want to hit them with the ta-da, and journalists don't have time for that ta-da. So you cannot bury the lead. You have to get right out there in the front and say, this is what I want to tell you about, and then provide the backup information. So don't lead up to it. Put the big news right out front so they can hear it, and then let them ask questions or provide the supporting evidence. But you kind of want to do it backwards from what your natural inclination. If you were telling a, a story to a friend, you might draw it out. You might draw it out and then hit them with the punchline. You can't do that in most of your media pitches. So let's talk about what a story idea is. Where are they coming from? Where are you getting story ideas from? Um, you know, I always tell my team, People make the place. We represent a lot of destinations. 
we represent a lot of small destinations in the southern United States. It would be very easy to blur the lines and just be like, well, they all have terrific fried chicken and wonderful, friendly people. But it's those people that really make the difference. Um, people really make a thing a thing. So, you know, we live in the United States where we can choose where we live and we can choose where we work. And so my theory is people have chosen to live in these places. So they're passionate about these places. So let them help you tell the story about that place. In your case, people can choose to work at your facility. So there's something that draws them there. There's something that they love about it. So rely on your people to help tell your story. Figure out who your colorful characters are. You know, is there somebody who is a docent who maybe this is their second or third career? Maybe they were a school teacher who used to bring kids to your garden as part of a field trip, and they loved it, and they were inspired, and so they wanted to come back and give up their time. Um, maybe there's somebody who started working there when they were 16 years old, and now they're 66, and they've spent their entire career there um, because they're just passionate about something there. Um, you know, the, the journalists that you're working with are going to find – the people who are not you and me far more interesting to talk to than the marketing representative or even the CEO. They want to talk to the people who are there doing the work, doing the stuff. Um, the second thing I'm going to tell you is quirk works. The weirder you've got, the happier the media is going to be. So if you have something unusual or offbeat or the largest collection of something or the tallest sunflower or the, the oldest, the newest, the rarest, whatever qualifier you have, that's going to be interesting to them. I will tell you, um, probably our most successful public relations campaign in my 25 years of doing public relations revolves around a goat named Betty who is at one of our resorts in Jamaica. And how she got to the resort is, I mean, if you think about Jamaica and you think about goats, often goats are on your plate. They are often curried and served as a lunch or dinner. Um, so in Jamaica, it's an island, so they try very hard not to be wasteful, and so they have a lot of green initiatives. And so the resorts often have partnerships with farmers where the resorts take their excess food and give them to the farmers to feed animals. And then that's kind of an, an economic relationship. So the resort we work with has a partnership with a pig farmer, and they take their kitchen scraps and they give it to the pig farmer, and he gives it to the pigs. But there is still a, a monetary value. And so I guess at one point they gave the, the scraps to the farmer, and he didn't have, he didn't have enough to, to, to make it an even exchange. So he gave the chef at our resort a goat. And I think he probably figured the goat would end up in a stew. Well, the goat turned out to be more like a dog than a goat. She's incredibly friendly, very lovable, likes to get on her back and have her tummy scratched. She is a very dog-like goat. And so the chef was like, clearly, we're not serving her for dinner. She is, she's, a, she's great. Like, we have, to, we have to hang out with her. What are we going to do with her? Well, what do you do with a goat? Goats tend to brambles and brush and this resort is in a jungle so they gave the goat to the groundskeeping crew and so the groundskeeping crew kind of kept her with them while they were working all day she would take care of part of the field they would take care of part of the field and anytime guests would walk by she would stand in the field and scream until they would come and visit her and she loved to be petted so then guests were like well you know we're going to the wedding of our friend can we take betty as our plus one so then this goat starts showing up at all the wedding ceremonies that are taking place at this resort. So it becomes one of these things where suddenly everybody wants an audience with Betty. And so the resort said, well, if everyone wants an audience with Betty, maybe we do lunches with Betty. Maybe we, you know, we do other interactions with Betty. So here we are three years later. Betty has, uh, she, they got her a friend. She officially had a wedding ceremony. Um, so that we could promote the weddings at the resort. She's had many babies. It's an adults-only resort, but we always talk about the only kids allowed at the resort are Betty's children, and she has become part of the brand of that resort. If you Google search Jamaican resort with goat, you're going to find Betty, and you're going to find plenty of pictures of her, and that is quirky and weird. Like, that's just weird stuff. And we have gotten the attention of everyone from Lonely Planet to USA Today to talk about this, this goat who um, has kind of transformed 
this particular resort, and some people stay at that resort strictly because they've read about Benny the Goat. That's a, an example of a quirky thing that really, really paid off. And it was so funny because when they first told me, I was actually at the resort when they said, you know, so do you want to see our goat? Like, it's the weirdest story. This, uh, the pig farmer gave us a goat. We didn't know what to do with her. We gave her to the groundskeeping crew. She loves us. And I went out and I saw her and I looked at them. I'm like, you guys, this is your story. Like, this is it. I know we've been trying to figure out what sets you apart from all your competition. Here she is. So think about the quirky stuff you've got going on. Um, my last piece of guidance is think outside of your own flower box. Like, it can't be all about you. Um, you know, think about the number of roundup stories that you see these days, the number of stories that are not just about one place, but around uh, many places, or there are a lot of like best fried chicken in each state or best place to take kids on spring break in each state. So you're probably going to be paired with other stuff. So get to know your friends and your competitors and be ready to talk about them. So that's why a group like this one that you all belong to is really, really great because it gives you people like you, facilities like you, that you can compare notes with. And I urge you to put aside the idea of competition and think about collaboration instead. That has really been a benchmark of my career as a public relations practitioner. Um, I, you know, I knew who my competitors were. When I worked for the state of Maryland, my competitors were Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, and the state of Delaware, and Virginia, and I got to know all of their PR people and figured out ways that we could work together and share the media. Um, so try to do that. If you can prove that what you've got going on is part of a trend, you're going to stand a better chance at getting your story told. At USA Today, they had this, this, this theory that you know, one was interesting, two is a coincidence, three is a trend. And when you have three, when you can prove three, then you've got a story. And I will tell you this as well, if you're the person who pitches the story, more than likely you get the lead paragraph of the story and you get the photo. So you want to be the person who comes up with the idea, but you might need to turn to your friends to, to prove the trend, but then you pitch it. Because if you pitch it, nine times out of ten the media is going to remember that you're the one who pitched it and they're going to give you the photo and they're going to give you the lead. Um, so as an example, what if your garden just started doing like nighttime tours or moonlight walks? Find out who else is doing that and then pitch that story to some outlets that you think would find that interesting. Also, while you're trying to find partners and collaborators, try to be what I call geographically correct. You want to represent a cross section. So, for example, I, write, I, I, I pitch a lot of national stories. So for me, if I'm pitching a national story about one of my clients, and say my client is in the Midwest, then when I'm looking for people to collaborate with, I'm looking for somebody on the East Coast, I'm looking for somebody in the Northwest, somebody in California, someone in Texas. I'm trying to, to spread out the, the, the story because that's what national media is doing. National media isn't going to want a story strictly about everything in the southern quadrant of the United States. They're going to want uh, geographical diversity, so I try to provide that for them. So let's say you have captured the attention of the media, and let's pretend for all intents and purposes this photo, is, it, this is of two people strolling through a garden. Let's pretend this lady on the left is a reporter and this lady on the right is you. This is you walking a reporter through the garden. Um, you want to cultivate the relationship with the media and make yourself invaluable to them. So how do you do that? For starters, you anticipate their needs. Um, my team knows rule number one, think like a journalist. Now most of them have never been a journalist, so I have to kind of explain to them what that means. Um, but think about if you were a journalist visiting your facility, what kinds of things would, would make you take interest? What would be interesting to you? What kinds of questions would you ask? And then you need to have those answers ready to go. So again, this is where your who, what, when, where, why, how, how much comes in. If you haven't had the opportunity to walk a lot of journalists through your property, I urge you to find a friend or a family member who doesn't spend a lot of time at your facility to do a walkthrough with you and see what strikes their fancy, see what captures their interest. Because sometimes we're so close to the story, we can't see it. Sometimes we're so used to something that it doesn't seem special to us. So it helps sometimes to have an extra set of outside eyes look at things before the journalists come so that you can in turn, anticipate the journalist's needs. Fill them with facts. 
Um, you know, there's, if you are old enough to know what the TV show Dragnet is, you know, just the facts. They always want just the facts. Facts are really important. And as we discussed earlier, a lot of times the media gets the facts wrong. So we want to do everything in our power to help them get the facts right. So I find it very helpful to have information written down and ready to share, especially when you're going to deal with numbers and technical things that the average person isn't going to know. And I think that your kinds of facilities fall into that category. I mean, everyone has seen a flower or a tree, but not everyone knows the name of that flower, that plant that they really love. They certainly don't know the Latin name. Um, they don't necessarily know all the sciencey stuff that goes on behind the scenes at your facilities. So write it down, spell it out for them. And you're not dumbing it down for them. You just can't expect everyone to have the same level of knowledge about these things that you and the rest of the team at your facility have. So writing it down is really helpful. It also helps the journalists save face if they don't know how to spell something or if they don't really understand what you're talking about. Having it written down means that they don't have to actually ask the question so much as they just have to look at the information you've given them. And you can send them some information via email. You can hand it to them when they come to visit you. You know, I know that we are supposed to be green, and you know, maybe we don't want to use paper as much. But I will tell you this, in all of my experience, all the years that I've been doing this, when journalists come on site, I always have a piece of paper for them because it's something that they can easily reference. It's something they can scribble their own notes on. Even if a journalist takes notes on their iPhone, I find that often they're scribbling notes on the piece of paper I give them. Um, it, it, they'll use it. They will use it. Um, it's much easier than giving them a thumb drive and being like, here's all the information you need. Well, while you're walking them through the garden, they're not probably going to be able to access that thumb drive and get that information. So give them that piece of paper. The last tip I have for you here is get the picture. Have images ready to go. I will tell you the number one reason that any of our clients ever gets rejected from a story if we've pitched it is because we don't have appropriate photography. Um, we, we chapter and verse tell our clients all the time, photos, photos, photos. We just have to have high-res images. We're a very visual society. These days, I mean, so many stories will not run if there isn't an appropriate photo. So if you don't have a photo, if you don't have video, your pitch as good as it is, your story, as awesome as it is, may not resonate with the media. So in my experience, most gardens have excellent photography. It's something that you guys have because, I mean, you're beautiful. So people are often taking photos, and, and that's great. Most gardens have great photography. If you do not, and if you're in a situation where you are really constrained with budget and you maybe don't have the budget necessary to bring in a professional photographer, I encourage you to do a guest contest. This works a lot. Um, we have a lot of clients who have very low budgets. They do photo contests, um, and the, you know, the arrangement is that they get all rights to the photos, whatever wins the contest. It's a great way to build your image library. It's a great way to make your guest feel like they are a part of your success. Um, it's, it can really work beautifully. So I do suggest that if you don't have a great photo collection. Um, we probably all remember the story of the tortoise and the hare, the whole idea of slow and steady wins the race. Um, so I'm going to tell you, slow is not going to help you. <laughs> steady will. So I want you to be the fastest tortoise. I want you to be very deliberate. I want you to be very accurate. Get your information together and be right the first time, and then try to be as quick as you can. Um, too often, too many times, a PR person in a hurry is not going to provide correct information or accurate information. Um, and you know, it is a race, but it's a race where both speed and accuracy matter. So I really, really encourage you to be as quick as you can when you're talking to the media and, and helping them, but also be accurate. You don't want to go back later and say, oh, I'm sorry, the information I gave you was in fact wrong. That makes you look silly. Um, and if you, let, let's say a journalist, you, you're on the phone with them or they're at your facility and you're walking through with them and they ask for something, either a piece of information or an image that you don't have on hand, say, you know, that's fantastic. I'm happy to get that to you right away. And then get back to your office and do it right away. Let's say you're walking somebody through the gardens, the gardens closes, they leave. Rather than getting in your car and leaving, go right back to your office and do whatever it is you told them you were going to do. So it is waiting for them when they get back to their desk. So you have to be fast. 
and then you have to be patient, which is really hard for me. I'm not a very patient person. But you have to wait while a story or a project is coming to fruition. You have to give it some time. I'm not lying when I tell you I have a story about the island of St. Croix that I've been waiting for for two years. And I know it's going to be amazing. It's in a great publication, and it just keeps getting pushed because there isn't really a timeliness to it. And remember, we talked about evergreen. The story is an evergreen, which means every month, if they have something that seems a little more newsy, they're going to push our evergreen story. It's okay to check in. I have on, on my calendar, like I check in about that story maybe every three months just to see where it is. And I know it's still on the editor's radar screen. I know it's still going to be published. It's just a question of when. So it's okay to check in and to stay in touch. You just don't want to be a pest. Um, so I also, you know, I've just spent 40 minutes telling you how to get to know the media and how to befriend them. But I want to warn you not to get too cozy with them and to never let your guard down. I have great relationships with the media. I count the media among my friends. However, I also know where there is a line. Uh, and it's not so much in what we do now. I mean, I work in the travel industry. You guys work with public gardens. Uh, it's not like we've got like inner secrets that we really can't share. But be very cautious about what you say, and not only the words you use, but your tone and your body language. Um, you know, I, for years, have worked with the amusement industry. I work in theme parks. and. You know, a lot of times a story, a happy story about something great in a theme park, a new ride or whatever, suddenly takes a turn and they want to get into safety. And you have to be ready to answer those questions, but you also have to, um, you, you have to be aware of your facial expression. You have to be aware, like, if you shrug your shoulders or if you, like, let's say you're in the garden walking through and, you know, telling the journalist about something and your, your boss walks by and you roll your eyes not a cool move. Um, like, let's think that, you know, maybe the journalist is going to think, oh, I wonder what's going on with, with this person. And so you just have to be very conscious of you, whatever it is you represent, you represent that all the time when you're with the media. Even if you're at a social function, even if at your, you're at a dinner where you're there and the media's there, just remember there, you're always on and don't, don't forget that. Um, your goal is to become a forget-me-not. Your goal is to make yourself so invaluable and so unforgettable to the media that they will rely on you, that they will refer to you, that they look at you as an expert. Um, it's taken us a long time in, in my industry, but these days when journalists need something, they know they can come to my team and me, and we will get it for them right away. So if something falls through, this happened last week. We had a journalist who was supposed to be doing a story about a Caribbean destination, not, not one of ours, um, and the resort she was staying at called her at the last minute. She was supposed to get on a plane in a couple of weeks, and they were like, yep, we've sold your room. We can't host you. And you know, there's a four-page feature that's being held in a magazine for this journalist's story. And she came to us and said, oh, my goodness, I need a resort fast, like, and I know that I can rely on you to help me. If, you, if one of yours isn't available, I know you know people in the industry who can help me. I've, I've, you know, I've got to satisfy my editor. What do I do? We love being that public relations agency. We love being that public relations resource um, because that means that we're invaluable to her. That means that she knows to call us. She knows that we will help her, and it means that it will benefit our clients in the long run. You know, when, when it's all said and done, when you've courted the media, when they've produced a story, when they've come out, when they've done a piece, make sure that you send your thanks. Tell them how much you appreciate it and share that story widely. Whatever the, however the story is out there, whether it's online, magazine, whatever it is, share it on social media, share it through every channel you know, because journalists are judged by their editors on how many clicks they get and how much interest seems to be being generated by the stories that they've placed. So show them your appreciation by sharing the story and getting it the clicks that they want so that they are there another day to write another story. You want to do whatever you can to tell them how much you appreciate them and keep cementing your relationship. Um, and if you think about it, that all goes back to what we talked about, um, you know, saying please and thank you. It's what your mom told you to do. Um, so keep that in mind. So that's what I have for you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mindy. Um, we definitely got some great tips from you on pitching to print and digital, long lead and short lead pitches. 
Um, and I especially appreciated the genuineness that you need in your messaging. Because um, like you said, um, you know, they can smell, you know, a phony uh, pitch, um, like a shark in the water. So um, that was definitely some great information. Excellent. Happy to share it. Um, okay. Our first question is, do you feel having a media event and inviting numerous journalists at once is appropriate, or is it better to invite journalists on an individual basis to keep it more of a personal experience? Um, I believe in both, and I think it really depends on the magnitude of what it is you're sharing, what it is you're revealing. Um, so I'm going to pull back to my career when I used to be uh, the PR director in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So anytime we had a new ride debuting at Hershey Park, we always did a full-fledged media event. We always brought all the local media out. We brought a lot of regional and national media out as well to ride the ride and to hear from the designer and to hear from the engineer because we just knew, I mean, most of our media events had – I'd say 40 to 50 people at them. So it was a lot of people. If we had tried to do 50 individual visits, that would have been mind-numbing. Um, and most of them were going to be looking for the same thing. They wanted to get on a ride, have the experience, talk to the same people. Um, but if you've got a smaller number of people and you feel like, okay, that outlet is going to be more interested in the human angle, this outlet is going to be more interested in the scientific angle, it might be better to do one-off individual visits. Um, so it really kind of depends on what kind of news you're trying to share and how many people you're sharing it with simultaneously. Um, but all of that is you should, you should treat everyone you know, personally. If you do a big media event, um, make sure that you and other members of your team are around to kind of interact with every member of the media that you've invited so that every member of the media feels like someone from your team has spent some time with them. And that's what we would do. I mean, even if we had 40 or 50 people at a Hershey event, I had a staff of seven at Hershey, and we would actually pull in our peers from marketing and other departments so that everyone felt like they had had some time with an employee from Hershey who could help them along their way. So. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to it, and I think both formulas can work. But at the heart of it, in, in either case, make sure that the media feels that personal touch from you guys. Great. Good point there, Mindy. Um, and also when running an event, you know, making sure that everyone on your staff is um, equipped with all the right information as well. Because if Absolutely. a reporter has a quick question, you know, it, it's great to make sure that everyone is um, up to date and has all the information. For sure. Um, okay, what are some tools that you would recommend to use for PR? Whether it's searching for media, sending releases, um, any tools that you can recommend? Yeah, you know, it's very funny. Um, nothing I can recommend heartily. I will tell you what tools we use, but I will also tell you that that when I go to public relations conferences, one of the number one topics of conversation is how much we hate the media tools <laughs> that are available to us. Because none of them really does the job as much as we want them to do or as well as we want them to do. So um, my team uses a product called Cision, and that's what we use to build our lists and to research media. But I will tell you that probably 60% of the time, we find what we want, and the other 40% of the time we don't find what we want on Cision. Um, so it, you know, it, it, sometimes it can solve your problems. Sometimes it just creates bigger problems. We also use Cision as one of our press release distribution services. But again, if the releases are only as good as the list that we've built, and if we don't feel great about the list we built based on the resources there, maybe they're not great lists. We also um, we have our own proprietary list. We have our own customized list of media that we know and that we love and that we work with who have asked, you know, please keep us posted on everything that's going on with your clients. So we have our own proprietary list, and we send out a lot of news to that list through MailChimp. Um, and so we use that as our, as our secondary distribution service. Um, you know, a lot of people monitor media. We, we have very small clients with very small budgets, so a lot of them don't want to pay for media monitoring. So we don't, you know, like Cision and Meltwater offer media monitoring. We don't actually pay for media monitoring because our clients 
don't want to pay that additional money. That means that our researchers are scouring websites every day. We're constantly doing Google searches. We all have Google Alerts. We have um, a system called TalkWalker, which is also free, that you can plug in your, you know, your search terms, and every morning you'll get a TalkWalker alert. So we try to do everything we can at as little cost as possible because our clients don't have big budgets. And um, so we've, we've tried to make sure we can do as much as we can while spending as little as we can. Um, so most of the services we use are free, but we do pay for Cision. Um, and I will say we pay too much for Cision. <laughs> but, uh, and we did a lot of searching, and that was the least of the evils for us. That was the system that seemed to work best for us after we did a bunch of analysis on their competitors. Great. Um, and how important is organizational buy-in in terms of um, providing resources for public relations? Incredibly important. And so I'm going to pull from my Hershey history again. When I first got to working at Hershey many, many years ago, um, they had not had an on-site PR director. They had had a large PR agency in New York City. and. I don't know that the relationship was really a two-way street. And so there were a lot of people, a lot of the upper echelon, the, you know, the highest ranking officials in the company, who really didn't have a lot of belief in public relations. They didn't really see the value in public relations. And so when I first joined the staff, I went around and I met with all the head honchos, and I kept hearing the same things. You know, public relations is always a burden on us. They need us to open up the park early because some TV station needs to be here at 5 o'clock in the morning. Or, you know, they always want us, you know, our chef needs to make a meal at a certain time. And, and so they looked at public relations as a burden, and they never saw the results. And so it was really a matter of trying to re-educate everybody and make sure everybody understood we're all in this together. I can't tell these stories without your help, but you should see the resulting stories, and you should feel appreciated for helping me with them. And so over the course of time I was there, I think we did a 180-degree change in people's perception of public relations. And I used to say to my team, you know, each of you guys is here. One of you represents the park. One of you represents the chocolate spa. One of you represents the garden. And one of you represents golf. I am the public relations person for public relations. It's my job to be your cheerleader. It's my job to educate the people that we report to about the value of public relations. And that meant I had to change the way I speak. I, I work in words. I love words. Words are my currency. But that's not how the big wigs, the CEOs, and the treasurers speak. They spoke in, more, in, in numbers. And, so, and they spoke in money. So what I had to do was take RPR efforts and convert them over to numbers. I had to show them, here's how many journalists we brought into the destination this month. Here are the number of stories we placed. Here is the value of those stories. If we had, buyed, if we had bought ads, in the same places that these stories ran. This is how much our marketing department would have had to spend. And so I, we took it and we made everything into numbers. And suddenly, the guys sitting around the board table took a very active interest in public relations. I also made sure that we were very good friends with our accountant. And I made sure we educated our accountant about who we were and what we did. And I brought the accounting department to our media events so they could see why we were spending thousands of dollars on you know, hot dogs for people. Um, you know, they got to see the interaction, and they, started to, they worked the media events with us, and we had their buy-in. So that when it came to budget time, I had our accounting guy sitting next to me saying, I have seen what this has done. I see the positive results. I think we should just give her the money. Um, so it, it took a long time. But it was an educational process. But the more buy-in we had, the more C-suite people who believed in what we were doing, the easier it was for us to get what we needed to, to do the job right. Great. Yeah, and it's so important to be able to showcase um, you know, the results that um, PR for your company is bringing in. And like you said, you know, it, it can be hard to show that, but a great way to do that is through numbers. So. Some great advice there. Um, how important is social media um, in the PR world today? I think that depends on who you're talking to. So I will outwardly admit 
I am not a big fan of social media. It's not how I as a person prefer to communicate. So it's not how I as a professional communicate. And we are a very old school public relations agency where we don't actually do public relations for our clients. Part of that is because I'm a big believer that your social media relationships should be, um, they should be as close to you as possible. Like I feel like they need to be real and live and authentic. There are a lot of agencies that will do your social media post for you, but I don't think that a social media post I do about our resort in Jamaica is going to be nearly as authentic as something that someone at the resort in Jamaica does. So we don't provide social media services. However, we have a lot of clients who really, really rely on social media. So we work in partnership with social media experts, either on staff or um, at another agency, and we make sure that all of our messages are aligned. Um, you know, I would say for, for gardens, social media is probably absolutely one of the best ways for you to share your information because you've always got great visuals. Um, so I, I believe in the, the power of social media. It's not, it's not the form of public relations that we practice, but it is a form of public relations that we run alongside when we have clients who see the value. But we also have some clients who just they, they don't see the value and uh, it, it does not work for them. So it really kind of depends on, on each individual place. Um, but you know, I'm a person who kind of straddles the line because it's not something that I personally love, but it's something that I professionally can see the value of. And I am supportive of you know, other social media teams doing their thing. Um, we feed a lot of information to social media teams. A lot of our press releases and blog posts and things get repurposed. So we're, we are content providers for a lot of the social media teams. We're just not actually doing the post ourselves. Okay, um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, how do you reply when associates from outside organizations ask you to share your media list? So, you know, it's interesting. I, this is very hard for me because I am a sharer and a generous person by nature, and I've had to learn in running my own PR agency, I don't share my list, even with clients. We don't share the list with clients unless or until the journalist is actually interacting with the client, in which case obviously we introduce them. But that is kind of a, a public relations agency standard. And um, my peers are like, no, 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 you will never share your list with clients. So we, that's, that's the rule that I have to follow. Um, I would say if you're talking about your peers, whether they are other, other facilities or whether they are you know, maybe other attractions in your destination, this is what I think. I mean, a list that I can just build incision, anyone can build it. And I sometimes will do that for a client. Like if they're like, hey, I need to know every blogger in the Midwest, we'll just quickly plug in decision, run a list, and give it to them. Because we don't have necessarily relationships with everybody on that list. That pr pr uh, the proprietary list I referred to, I would not share that with a soul. Because those are people that we have relationships with. And honestly, Probably if somebody else reached out to those people, they wouldn't even respond because they're like, why do you know me and why are you reaching out to me? So um, I am pretty protective of relationships, but I'm not necessarily protective of a generic list that I don't really have a strong connection to anyone on it. So I, that's, a, that's a tough call. It really kind of depends on the circumstances of the person who's asking the question. If it's somebody that you know and trust and, and you want to help them out, and you have a list of maybe 25 media that are really key, maybe, maybe you, you do your friend a favor. But broadly, in general, I, I don't really believe in sharing the list because they are your contacts, and you've worked really hard to develop those relationships, and that's not something you necessarily just want to give away. Um, so I don't know if that's answered the question, but for the person who asked that question, you, you've got my contact information on this screen, and you know, you're welcome to reach out to me. And if I understood maybe your very specific circumstance, I might be able to give more definitive guidance there. Yeah, and I think that could also open an opportunity to maybe send you know, a joint pitch. You know, if it is um, you know, a, a partner organization, a sister garden, you know, that is interested in sending something, you know, maybe you team up and kind of send that information together to kind of build a meteor story. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big fan of partnering, collaborating, working together. 
Um, but even that, you know, I, there have been some occasions where I've worked on a project with a friend that the friend has just said, you know, just send it to your list. Don't like, I don't, I don't even need to see your list. Just send it to your list. Um, so I think there, there are positives and negatives to it. I am a, a person who really wants to help others. I really want to try to help others be as successful as they can be. Um, but then I also remember, gosh, you know, it took me a long time to forge these relationships. Um, I will say, you know, it's interesting because those relationships with the media are pretty much what we as public relations people are. And so the first job I left when I left the state of Maryland many, many years ago, I, of course, had these great lists of media contacts. And I actually asked our legal department, hey, like when I leave, I can take my list with me, right? Like, because these are my media contacts and these are their email addresses and I'm allowed to take that list with me, right? And they said, yeah, they are your relationships. As long as you leave your list so that the next person taking your job has a starting point, you may absolutely take that list with you because they're your relationships. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, I think this was a great segue into, um, you know, kind of promoting your brand and how that can in turn create um, a great culture for your organization. So thank you so much. And um, you can see Mindy's information there on the screen. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Mindy. Thanks, everyone, and good luck with your public relations efforts. And um, we will be taking um, a short break, and we will be back at uh, 1 o'clock. So thanks, everyone, and we will see you soon. Welcome back everyone. Uh, this is Katie Mobley from Longwood Gardens. I serve as the webinar committee co-chair along with Abby and I'll be leading us through the remainder of today's webinar. We enjoyed a fantastic morning thanks to Rob and Mindy. Rob led us through how to align brand and culture while Mindy explored how to grow your PR program and fully utilize relationships with the media. Hopefully you're ready and refreshed for this afternoon as we focus on how to provide an extraordinary guest experience at your organization in our final session led by Chuck Roth of Longwood Gardens. Well, before we hear from Chuck, I'd like to introduce APCA Marketing and Communications Manager Richard Duran, who will be sharing information on the expanded National Public Gardens Week and some of the marketing and fundraising opportunities available to you from the association. Please send any questions you have for Richard through the Q&A feature and we'll be happy to address them. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katie. <clears throat> Sharing the screen now, terrific. Yes, I am Richard Duran. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at the American Public Gardens Association. And uh, just wanted to take a little bit of time today to talk about National Public Gardens Week. National Public Gardens Week debuted last year after 10 years as National Public Gardens Day. It had always been the Friday before uh, Mother's Day. And this year we are, we, well, last year we expanded it to a full week. And uh, this year it's going to run from the Friday before Mother's Day through the Sunday after Mother's Day. That's May 8th to the 17th. And one of the reasons we extended it to the full, uh, full 10 days is that a lot of people still wanted to do National Public Gardens Day on the Friday before Mother's Day. And uh, so we just decided to keep everybody happy and, and let them go with that. The purpose of National Public Gardens Week is to emphasize the importance and impact of public gardens as community resources and catalysts for change in the community. Um, it's one of the things that we have found is that public gardens have that opportunity to really be able to reach out as part of your admissions to be part of that experience for your visitors. We also want to emphasize how gardens grow resilience amongst the individual, the, uh, the community itself, and also the world at large so that people can build their own resilience by visiting your gardens, be a part of the community itself, and how uh, it's, it's emphasizing resilience amongst the community, and then also for the world itself, uh, be part of the addressing the global challenges of climate change and other issues. 
The three themes we have are to visit value and volunteer at your public gardens. Um, those are the main categories in which we have found that gardens have been participating with their programming. Um, and the programming is, is the important thing for us. What we are really looking for is participation. Just there is no wrong way to participate, except as we like to say, to not participate at all. Um, there are all sorts of different events that gardens have offered throughout the years. And unlike in past years, we have gotten the uh, form out a lot earlier. We launched it back in January with our uh, just around our mid-month mid uh, newsletter to everyone. Um, but it is up on the website now. You can find it at publicgardens.org. It's under the Programs tab and then National Public Gardens Week. And what we've tried to do is really um, address some of the complaints that we had from last year when we did this for the first time. And that was... Uh, the form was a little bit clunky. Uh, we hope we have streamlined it a little bit and, and made it a lot easier for you to use and made it a lot easier to enter as many events as you'd like to. And there is no requirement to specific, you know, for a specific type of event. Um, I'll show you in a little bit the, the places where you can find some of the examples that gardens have done over the past decade is National Public Gardens Day, but also in National Public Gardens Week. Um, it really can be anything. Um, and a lot of gardens just post things that they're already doing. It's really a way for you to get some, uh, some things, uh, some additional publicity for your garden's activities during the week and uh, up and around Mother's Day. Um, one of the places you can find some ideas is the National Public Gardens Week Toolbox, which is on the website. You can also find that under Programs and then National Public Gardens Week. Um, one of the PLC ideas under the visit volunteer and value um, topics and there is a short video toolbox as well. There's really again no wrong way to participate. Um, you'll also see right there there's an example from last year Sherman Library and Gardens out in uh, Costa Del Mar, California did an entire uh, themed day each week or each, each day had a specific theme during the week and it's really something that I think um, worked out very well for them. Um, again, not a requirement, but it is something for you to think of. And then there's also uh, the My Garden fundraising campaign, which we'll also talk about a little bit. Um, there is a strategy guide on the website and some things of, that's a, a pilot fundraising campaign that we started last year, which um, if you don't have the ability to do things like text to give or uh, online donations, and I know most gardens do have those things and we've integrated those as well, but we do have the opportunity for you to take that. Taking a quick look at the event form, um, this is the new form that we have going out this year. Uh, you can submit your event and we do have the ability for you to print out coupons from the website if uh, you want to use our coupons for the events, just so you can track who is coming and, and how they may have got found out about your events. Um, thankfully this year you're only going to need to put in your contact information once. All of this information, as you can see, is strictly for association use only. It does not appear on the website anywhere. It's a way that we can track and make sure that the person who is entering the events are, is actually with the garden. And also that um, we can contact you after and find out how your uh, experience with National Public Gardens Week went. Um, you'll see at the bottom there, it says garden. And as you start typing in your name, it should populate what your garden's name is. Uh, you can then select that. If you are not a fully paid up member of the association, your garden will not appear. Um, and you can certainly contact us at info at publicgardens.org and find out um, what is going on. Uh, we've already had a couple of gardens contact us after we launched the form in January. Then there's a place to enter just a general statement about your garden's plans for the week. This would appear on a banner that will be on the, your garden's page on our website. As you may know, every garden that's a member of the association has a specific page on the website. And during National Public Gardens Week, a banner will appear at the top of that with uh, your statement about what your garden is doing and also a link to your, um, your, the events that are specifically happening at your garden that are listed on our website. Um, and again, here we have the My Garden campaign. There are a couple of different ways that you can uh, be a part of that. One is if you are doing it through our uh, Mobile Cause uh, affiliate, then you can put in your campaign URL there. If you just want to make sure that you can drive people to your own website where they can make donations, um, you can put in your own fundraising campaign URL there as well. So um, hopefully that we'll find some, um, I think we raised over 12 point or 12 
$1,500 last year um, during National Public Gardens Week for the gardens that were participating in the My Garden campaign. Then you can add your events, and uh, if there are any coupon offers, um, it's fairly uh, short and sweet, the event title and event description. Um, there are a couple of places where you can click to see what the offer will look like. Um, and also, if you want to drive people to your own website to a ticketing opportunity, if you have a paid ticketing, or if you have some way that you want to track people through your own website, you can just put a URL into the alternate offer URL there, and that will create it for you. It's down the bottom there. Just enter the website or the page you would like to direct the user to, and uh, they can certainly get more information. Then you can add your date and time. Um, one of the things that we did have a problem with last year was people that had a garden tour every day of the week had to enter them in every single time. Uh, this way, if you have the same event that's happening on more than one day, you can just click the add another date button and that will populate multiple dates onto your, um, your the same event. Just makes it a little easier to, to put in uh, as many offers and, and, and events as you'd like. Um, then you can also choose the type of activity that it is. There's all sorts of different ways that, are, uh, that we can sort. Um, this will appear on the events page itself so that users, if they're just looking for, you know, where is a um, discounted or free admission or where can I find a special tour of the gardens, um, that will populate for them. Users will also be able to search by the area around their garden or their, I'm sorry, their specific location. Um, Last year it was 150 miles, which as you can imagine showed a whole bunch of different gardens. This year uh, users will be able to enter the radius around their specific location and really drill down and find the gardens in their area a lot easier. Um, one of the things that we have added this year is Earth Day Every Day. As you may know, the uh, Earth Day 50th anniversary is this year and that will be happening in April. Uh, one of the things that they are doing as a theme this year is to try to make every day Earth Day. And so if you have something that's specifically related to Earth Day or follows the themes of Earth Day, you can click this button um, and it will be Earth Day every day. And we are going to be able to give them the, uh, the Earth Day, part the Earth day um, producers the link to that list and uh, they will promote it on their website and to their lists as well. So there's an opportunity there. Once you've entered all that information, you simply click the create event and coupon offer and that will then create the event and bring you to this screen. You'll be able to see the events that you've added in. If you want to, you can remove or edit them before you finally post them. If you want to add more events, you can click add new event and coupon offer and that will take you back to put in the information about what your next event would be, date and time, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. When you're finished adding in your events for the week, just click the submit all events button. Um, it would be easier for all concerned if you do enter in all of your dates before doing that. You can enter them individually, but um, we'd really uh, appreciate if you would take the time to enter them all in before entering the submit all events page. We are going to list the uh, start the events list uh, in March, um, which will give users a good to two and a half months before National Public Gardens Week opens so that they'll have an opportunity to find events in their area. Um, users can go to nationalpublicgardensweek.org or .com and that will take them directly to our gardens map, which I'll show you in just a second. We also have secured mpgw.info if you're looking for a smaller URL, it's a lot easier to say to some people and also to fit in uh, some of the places where you might have um, shorter entry boxes and, and a, a list in a uh, limit on the number of um, events that you or number of characters you can use. This is our uh, um, gardens map. This is showing all the gardens within 150 miles of Philadelphia. And you can see right smack dab in the middle, a nice little orange flower that indicates that that garden has entered in events for National Public Gardens Week. Um, this was taken yesterday, so there are gardens in the, in the area and also across the country that have already entered in their events. Um, they will not show up on the website until March, but you will be able to identify who's, uh, what gardens are participating in National Public Gardens Week by the little orange flower. If you click on that, it will take you to a box that will take you either to the gardens page itself 
or directly to the events list of events that are happening at that garden. Um, as we did last year, when we do launch the events list, um, that will go up into our main navigation. Uh, last year it was between About Public Gardens and Members, and it was just National Public Gardens Week. It took users directly to both the events page and to the gardens map, and then also to some of the other pages like our partners. Um, we will be partnering with the uh, United States Forest Service again this year, and we're looking forward to that. They did a lot of good things with us last year. And one of the ways that we've really got some of the, uh, the, the message out from the association directly to the public, this is our primary public facing opportunity for the year, uh, was social media. Um, the combined reach of all of our social media uh, partners and partner gardens was well over 200 million people. Um, there's also the My Garden fundraising campaign and the Go Green landmarks that we did across the country. Uh, right here, you can see the green Great Wheel in Seattle, um, the downtown Mobile, Alabama, and also we had a ceremonial lighting of uh, Niagara Falls, um, thanks to our partners at the Niagara, Fa uh, Niagara Parks and Recreation Group up in Niagara Falls, Canada. Uh, they are a member of the association, and um, every night the there is an opportunity for a, a ceremonial lighting of Niagara Falls, and we're anticipating that that will happen again this year. There is uh, our handles on National Public Gardens Week. We are at, uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. We are also on uh, LinkedIn, which I don't have right here, but this is at Public Gardens and at American Public Gardens on Instagram. Um, we also have a National Public Gardens Day page on Facebook, which you may have seen we are using that as our garden a day. We uh, put, post up every day in member garden to all of our platforms, including National Public Gardens Week. And the hashtag that we are using is National Public Gardens Week. Uh, last year, we reached about 4.7 million people with that hashtag, and we're looking for more this year, and I think we can get it. Um, information about the mobile cause fundraising, it is online and text to give. Uh, we have put together a several how-to webinars last year. Joan Thomas, our Director of External Relations, has those up. They are on YouTube, and you will be able to find them on the National Public Gardens section of the website. Um, it should be really simple to, to join up. Uh, you can create your own page on Mobile Cause and direct people to it, or just uh, you'll be able to give them a special number to text to, and then they will get a prompt to go back and fulfill their pledge during the fundraising week. And finally, uh, the important part for us, uh, we'd just love to hear what you guys are all doing with National Public Gardens Week. Um, send us your stories, photos, uh, videos, anything. There's all sorts of fun stuff that goes on at gardens across the country. And uh, we have gotten a lot of good stuff. I have a video that we did debut at uh, the annual conference last year. Um, but I will run again at the end here. Um, but that's pretty much the, the, the end of my presentation. So do send us your stories. Uh, we are looking forward to it and uh, have, hopefully uh, having another record-breaking year for us. Um, happy to take any questions if anybody has them. Uh, yeah, thank you, Richard, for all that information on what's sure to be a great National Public Gardens Week. Um, we did have a couple questions come in as you were sharing. Uh, the first is from Aaron White. And Aaron asks, is the mobile cause capability available independently of National Public Gardens Week? We, uh, mobile cause is a partner of ours, an affinity partner. On, so if you look on the website, it is um, under members and then affinity programs. You can get information about using mobile cause more often. Um, one of the things that we have, do use National Public Gardens Week for is sort of a test drive. So if you want to find out how it all works, um, you can do that during National Public Gardens Week. And if you then wanted to uh, contact Mobile Cause and become a partner with them, there are some, uh, let's, I forget if there's a, I believe there's a discount from Mobile Cause in terms of uh, signing up with them as a member of the association. Um, but you can certainly use that as a test drive to find out if that will work well for you. Okay, and our second question that came in, Richard, uh, is there any web usage data that can be shared from last year's National Public Gardens Week, such as click rate by event or garden, et cetera? 
We do have some of that information. Um, I don't unfortunately have it at my fingertips right now, but I can certainly put that together and um, look to include that when we send out some more information about National Public Gardens Week. It is really a, the, a big spike in traffic to our website. You can certainly see it in the, in the Google Analytics if you go and when we go and look at them. Um, I don't have a specific number that I can think of right now, but again, uh, through uh, we had uh, it was our social media advertising reached over 340,000 people uh, across the country in um, on Facebook. We did a bunch of little videos, including. Uh, some girls running through a garden, um, which are also included in the video that we have coming up shortly. Um, but really, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity for us. And then, of course, the 4.7 million um, accesses of the National Public Gardens Week hashtag. Um, but I'll see if I can dig up some of the information from National Public Gardens Week and, and make that available in the Marketing and Communications Community Forum. Okay, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, we're going to take a short, about 10-minute break um, and pick back up at 1.30 uh, with Chuck Ross as he gives us our final session of the day. Terrific. I'm just going to hit play on this, and you guys, we'll see you at 1.30. Good morning, Lauren Hall here from the Buffalo and Erie County Botanical Gardens. I'm standing by with Erin Grayjack, and we came to visit today because A, it's cold and gloomy out. This is a great place to come when the weather is how it's been this last stretch. B, it is the National Public Gardens Week. So this is actually the first National Public Gardens Week. There's normally a National Public Gardens Day, but this mm -hmm. year it's an entire week. It's put on by the American Public Gardens Association. This week is also National Public Gardens Week, where people can learn more about the importance of building vibrant, relevant gardens gardens to enrich the community while sustaining environmental responsibility. Well, switching gears this week is National Public Gardens Week and the LSU Ag Center is inviting you to join in on this celebration. New botanical gardens on the Treasure Coast are participating in the National Public Gardens Week. and approaching guest resolution. In this session, you'll hear from Long Gardens Associate Director of Site Operations, Chuck Ross, as he discusses the journey Longwood has undertaken to create its culture of guest excellence and the importance of institutional buy-in for this culture. You'll also receive an informative and fun crash course in mastering Longwood's steps of service and guest resolution approach. Please note that Chuck's session will be in two parts. The first part, during which Chuck will share background on creating a culture of excellence, will be followed by its own Q&A and then a short break. Following that short break, we'll jump into our guest resolution crash course, so be sure you stay tuned for that. 
To give you a bit of background on Chuck, his team oversees the guest experience for Roma Gardens, more than 1.5 million annual visitors. For the last 10 years, he has been involved in the development and delivery of our Guest Experience Academy to all full and part-time staff members to ensure we have one clear message of hospitality. Before working for Mama Gardens, Chuck worked for William Sonoma and Smith and Hawkins, opening stores and training staff across the country. Based on any questions you have for Chuck throughout the session via the Q&A feature, and we'll be happy to address some towards the end of the session. Please join me in welcoming Chuck. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad that reverb went away. I would have sounded like an alien ship the whole time. So uh, I, hopefully it's much better now. Um, again, my name is Chuck Ross. I'm the Associate Director of Site Operations, and that falls under um, guest experience here. Uh, <clears throat> and I have been here for 10 years. I came straight from Smith & Hawkins, where I worked for 10 years. Um, and in the last 10 years, I have seen an enormous amount of change uh, especially in our view of guest experience. Uh, we had a huge culture change, going to culture is brand, brand is culture. We had a huge uh, culture change when we began this process. It took a long time. So we're going to go start with going over kind of the how and the why we started um, creating the guest experience academy, the guest experience uh, culture here at Longwood. Um, when we created the culture of guest excellence, I will have to say we needed the cultural institutional buy-in um, and we were starting from zero. We had nothing. When Paul Redmond got here in 2006 as our uh, president and CEO, we didn't even have a guest services department. He created that in 2007. So we were really working uh, from the ground up. So if any of you feel like you are at the ground or just above that, don't feel bad. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that we were in the exact same spot. Uh, for us, when Paul got here, uh, he wanted to really re look at everything and we rewrote our mission, vision, values. Um, you know, our vision, Longwood Gardens is one of the great gardens of the world and we strive for innovation, arts in an unparalleled setting and to contribute to society through uh, excellent and diverse educational programs, but it was really under our core values that this change came, you know, with our core values of uh, excellence, professional leadership, fiscal alignment, stewardship, and community engagement. But this focus really uh, was under the core value of excellence. Um, and when we gathered the entire staff of Longwood for meetings to discuss this, the core values, um, and how to make them a reality and not just a talking point. One thing that came up was that Longwood needed to really change how it looks in, in dealing with the, with the guest. Um, it wasn't that long ago that the staff here, the Hort staff, facilities, maintenance, they were in a sense to be seen, uh, to be not seen and not heard. It was almost like it was a magic kingdom and things just happened overnight and you weren't really supposed to talk to the guest. Um, and the staff was fine with that. With this change, um, one of the institutional goals, a five-year master plan that we came up with uh, in 2010 would, was to achieve an extraordinary guest experience. Um, and this came directly from Paul, from our leadership, and he let everyone know this was the direction we were going. This was going to be the new Longwood. And it was going to take a long time because now we were saying to the Hort staff, the facilities, the painters, the engineers, as well as the guest services staff, um, you're going to interact with the guest. You, we want you to interact with the guest the same way that someone trained in guest services would. And that's not just something you can say, okay, everybody go out and be nice. Um, it was a lot of learning, um, a lot of modeling. How were they going to do it? What are their expectations? And people were uh, concerned that you know, they just didn't know what was going to happen. So we had to make them comfortable. We had to make everyone know what the, the standards were and to get their buy-in uh, as well. We began a strategic planning, global benchmarking. We looked at the strategic plan, 
we built a business model on it. And I will say this, even though this is one of our five, this was one of our five strategic goals, when it came to how much money we got to make this happen, it felt like we had a budget of zero. So we did not have a lot of money. Most of the money that came from it was a payroll that we used in training, but we didn't have a lot of money and we did this really on our own at, at this point. So um, if you don't have a lot of money for this, I know what it's like because we did this on a shoestring. We really did it, I have to say, well, we do it much better now, but starting from nothing, it's really, it's really come a long way and it was very successful uh, for us um, in the end. Not that we're at the end, we're, it's a never ending process. Uh, benchmarking, what we did was um, our, our director of um, what would now be our vice president of guest services did is she gathered people from every single department of Longwood. Uh, even from the shop and the restaurant, which are outsourced for us, but every single department. There had to be a representative from education, facilities, maintenance, anything that you can think of, there was a representative. And at that time, really the only requirement of what she was looking for were those people that really interacted with the guest well. What did they do? Got them together, created a, a, a team, and they began benchmarking, talking about different places they liked that they had faith in. Uh, some here, L.L. Bean, Rich Carlton, of course, I, I would say that we probably focused on that the most, followed by Disney, Starbucks, Kohl's, which I always thought was a funny one that people kept bringing in. But I think what people liked about Kohl's is it had very little rules. Um, they have less rules than we do. But uh, I think people really liked that. So we benchmarked. We talked about what we liked about these places and what we didn't like. Uh, as that process grew, we created this, um, our guest experience model. And we honestly use this today. So we've used this going on seven, only about seven years now, um, with very little change in the in the model. What's What we do inside of each of these has been a little different. But um, it pretty much still looks just like this. That base is all staff, volunteers, students, and management. Really two different things. Part of it is that's who created this model. These were the people that were involved with it. But then also, as we move forward, it's all of us that are involved with really interacting with the guest and making this a reality. This team created, or we didn't create, I'm not gonna say that, but we did choose the steps of service that we found most useful here at Longwood. And when we go over the next part, we will run through that um, as well. Professional development, for us, it means classes. It means actually talking about it every day. Um, we have lineups 365 days a year. We're open 365 days. We open at 9 a.m., 365 days a year. So at 8.30, every day, we start with a lineup and we go over everything that's happening in the garden today, but then also one person, usually from the guest services team, but it doesn't have to be, will talk about one of the steps of service uh, that and what they're gonna do this day to make it continue. That is taken from the Rich Carlton. Uh, we stole that right out. It's something they do, they start every day with the lineup, talk about what's gonna happen in the day, and then they talk about one of their uh, core values or steps, whatever they actually call it. But we really felt that there were, there were companies out there that came up with great game plans and brands and visions for their company, but their teams didn't know about it. They really, it really wasn't disseminated down to the people that actually um, have FaceTime with the guest. And ultimately those organizations fail. Companies that you see have longevity, really keep it going, are ones that talk about their brand. It's a living thing for them, not just something that comes out in a paper once in a while or they get an email reminder, but something that becomes so ingrained in the culture that people that don't follow this get worked out by the culture. Uh, measuring key KPIs, key performance indicators. We have, for the last seven years, 
had three questions in every survey that we've sent out that really remained unchanged. Would you recommend Longwood Gardens to a friend? How would you rate us one to 10? And are we worth the value? Are we worth the money? And we can measure that by the five seasons of Longwood or by a special day or by the year. Um, this really keeps us legal, keeps us honest because we can say to ourselves, we're doing a great job, <laughs> but this gives us some data on where we are doing a great job. And it also gives us some data where we're falling short. Uh, we spend a little more time looking at the data on where we fall short, but um, it, it gives us a place to grow. And then we communicate those results to the staff again through the lineup and then we also have a quarterly staff meeting where all our staff gathers in our ballroom um, and they get uh, uh, a state of the nation from people here at Longwood and our goal here is to have 100 percent satisfaction and that number we would want from our surveys when we finished with what we wanted the academy to look like those people on the, the on the lowest level or the base i should say uh, that created this went to one of these quarterly staff meetings and they presented in front of everyone. So instead of it coming from the president or the directors or the VPs or upper management, this was presented to the staff from their peers, people that worked with, that really had face time and were in the trenches daily because we didn't want this to look overly managed, something, you know, from the Crystal Tower that came from above, but really from the trenches. Here are the people you work with every day. This is what we want to do. And this came out as the new Longwood, where we were going, how many years it would take to put everyone through the, the classes and um, the professional development that we had planned for them. And some people were concerned, but we wanted them to realize there was nothing to be afraid of. It's really just about being nice to the guests. It's not rocket science. It certainly isn't, but it's about messaging. It's about talking about it every day and making it part of the culture. Uh, delivering the culture of guest excellence. This is going back to professional development systems and communication. So where money went into this was also part of just a, a bigger scheme for Longwood. But the systems that guest services, ticketing came up with, we wanted it also to be able to measure um, and keep track of the guest. If anything went wrong, anything went right, so that we can get data internally outside of just looking for um, surveys. So when we created the Academy, the idea was to unify all staff. And I think that was really one of the biggest points is and this is something that when we give these, when we've given this class or we've talked about this um, to other organizations, we get this bounce back. Well, guest services is really into this and so is marketing, but the horticulture department will never buy into this. Um, we're trying to get our leadership to really see the value of this. I will tell you if that's where you are, um, that's a tough place. It is a tough place because Paul, our director, he has talked, or our president, ha, um, has talked to other garden presidents and CEOs and has told them that if they are not the ones driving this, it's going to fail. You can't push this uphill. This has to be an organizational buy in. It has to come from the top who has to say to their leadership, this is what we're doing. We're all in it together. And then you have to have 100% um, you know, uh, uh, agreement on this and it's all in it together. So unify all staff to achieve an extraordinary guest experience, set clear expectations, easy expectations, really nothing, nothing difficult, um, but clear expectations, uh, comfort. I really think that's kind of the biggest thing. People, it wasn't like people were like, I hate everyone and I want to be mean. It was never that. It's just some people are less comfortable interacting with the guest. And it's not like, oh, you can only hire extroverts. It has nothing to do with that. Introverts, extroverts, we have found all of them have been successful in this when it is presented to them in a way that makes sense. The shyest gardener here, if you ask them to talk about plants, 
will then begin to talk nonstop with joy to, to a guest about plants. So it was really teaching people uh, simple skills on how to communicate the things that they know best, but that they love. And then that passion would come through and the guests loved it. Um, and then sharing experiences on um, how to be connected with the guests, let other people talk of simple things they did um, that they, that other guests, that other staff here could uh, mimic and do it easily. And we wanted people to have fun. This was not, this was never out, okay, you're gonna be nice to everybody, you're all fired. It was never anything like that. We didn't want it to be like that. Um, we wanted people to be comfortable enough with it that they could um, express it naturally to the guest. The academy that, that has we built it, uh, the art of engaging the guest, delivering a genuine first impression, and what genuine means, um, and engaging with the guest. For us, really, it was trying to give everyone questions that they could ask the guest, uh, because we found it wasn't so much that we needed to talk, but we needed to get the guest talking to find out what, they, what their expectations of their visit here at Longwood was and how we could best deliver that for them, how we could best direct their day so that they would have a, a good experience. Anticipating guest needs, doing little things uh, to exceed the guest expectations. And when we started this, everyone was coming out with the craziest things in the world, giving everyone a, a special tour of Longwood. You know, we have, for us, we have anyone, yesterday was a slower day. We had 3,000 uh, guests. Um, at Christmas, we went as high as 20,000 in one day. It's too much. But uh, with that many people, it's really hard to do big, giant things for people, but there are nice little things that we can do for the guest um, that everyone can do. I will tell you, there is hardly a chance that any guest is going to take a picture of a friend of theirs without somebody coming up and saying, would you like me to take a picture of you together? That simple little thing has shown up more on our surveys than almost anything else we do, and it takes five seconds. But that has become a culture. Never pass a guest with a map, never pass a guest taking a picture without offering to take a picture for them. So simple little things that other people would talk about um, that you all do already in your own gardens, but we just made it uh, part of the culture. We just ingrained it in everyone's head so that everybody did the same thing. And you didn't have to worry that, oh, I hope John's working today uh, and not Michael, because oh, Michael, you never know what he's going to be like, but John's always friendly. We were trying to get past that, that everybody was a John. Everybody was really nice to everybody. Um, but then we also talked about the reality, uh, resolution. What do you do when everything you've tried to do during the day to make someone happy and they're not happy? Or more likely, the guests are having a great time, but they're doing something that you don't want them to do. We don't want them to do, either for their safety or the safety of the, or the protection of the garden. What do you do then um, to, and we, really talked about that with resolution, you can't skip the four steps of service. You really still have to maintain that uh, friendliness, the kindness, even if you want to explode or scream because someone's doing something, you can't do that. And part of the, the, the thought was, even if somebody's mad at us when, when we begin the conversation, we would so want to turn it around that at the end, we've cultivated loyalty in, in them. Doesn't work every time. But there are many a time here that I can remember when a guest is mad and then before they left, they bought a membership from us because they were so happy with the way we took care of their issue. Here you can just see that uh, we use a system called SharePoint, certainly uh, very available. Um, and what it does is everyone pulls up their computer every day to log in, to boot up, this comes up on their screen first. It tells them everything that's happening in the garden during the day. Um, SharePoint will go over everything that's happening in the garden upcoming. So if you have a big project coming, if you're going to close a section of the garden, is there anything that could, there's anything that could um, impede the guest vis visit or change things, it's there so we know it's coming. But the biggest thing is here's today. And so we would take that start our lineup, go over everything that is available to the guests that day, because we want to make sure 
a guest doesn't come here and miss a free organ concert or a talk about the water lilies or anything that's happening. So it's really important that we all start our day knowing what is actually happening um, in the garden. Um, here's a guest record. We can go into a, a guest record and it doesn't have to be a member, though it's a lot easier if they are. If a guest has an issue, we can take their name and phone number, something like that. And just from that, even if they're not a member and have a record of them. And we can see if they've had an issue with us, how we uh, took care of it, the options to taking care of it. Um, it's on us idea is what we first started. We don't say that as much anymore. We just say comp tickets. Um, we have found comp tickets, free visits to come back are like magic and people can be furious. You mentioned comp tickets and everything is fine again. And if a guest is mad because something is closed or not working here today and they thought it was going to be, and I, I have a talk with them, I will say, I honestly say, I completely understand why you're upset. I'm gonna give you comp tickets to come back another day and then I'll discuss the issue with them. Because once you get past the point, if you, make, if you talk to them about 10 minutes and they think they're not getting anything or they're not getting get a comp, they're gonna get mad. But with that said, I don't give out that many comp tickets. You would think we just run around throwing them in the air all day and we're allowed to. We are absolutely allowed to. You know, if, if a guest is mad, it is an, it is a, every employee here is able to give out comp tickets and we have a system for that. Um, it's pretty easy to be honest. We tried to make it complicated at first and now it's, it's very easy, but most people we find if they're upset, they just want to talk about it. They just want someone to listen to them. They want to be heard. I've had people say, you know what? I don't need comp tickets. Thank you. I'm a member, but I'm glad that you offered. It was very nice of you. You were, you listened to me um, and we can normally turn things around easily, but if we need to, um, here's a comp ticket for them and we have a record of it and why. And then at the end of the quarter or season or whenever we want, we can run a report for the reasons we gave out comp tickets. And if something pops up all the time, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a red flag that we need to fix something. So it's really how we can improve ourselves as well. But this really does come in handy, but this is just part of our ticketing system. This is us selling tickets and these are just other options within that to keep track uh, of the guest. Also, as we got deeper into this and we really started to think about changing their culture and we wanted employees that were, were able to interact with the guest in an ease, ease, uh, easily, I can't think of the word, in an easy way, we really began to think of the whole process and we went backwards. Okay, so when we're hiring people, do we look at those qualities in people? Because you could have three gardeners all employ, uh, all um, up for the same job, and one seems outgoing and engaging, and the other's not too much. That should be the final pick, and that is what happened. The selection process uh, became very important because our review process then brought in that the brought brought in how this person engages with the guest. So if you're giving a review and you have someone who has not been interacting with the guest well, you now have a lot of work to do. You have coaching, you have guidance, you have to give this person, you have to give a lot more work. So how much smarter to really try to hire people that are just a bit more friendly, a bit more outgoing. And the benefit of that is if they're nicer and more engaging to the guest, chances are they're going to be nicer and more engaging to each other, to the staff. And now you have a better work environment. Just the whole culture is moving to a place of being nicer and friendlier and thinking about that things, uh, thinking about those things. And that is what we saw. Harvard Business Review, these numbers haven't changed, they change, but they haven't changed that much over the years. If you pull these numbers up, it might be one or 2% change each year. They come out every year, but they're very telling um, in terms of staffing engagement. 29% uh, of employees are energized and committed to their work. These are your go-getters. These are the self-drivers. These are the people that really want to come in, 
They're engaged when they're here. They work hard. They're your top performers. 54% of employees are neutral. They come in, they do their job, uh, not a lot more. Um, and there's nothing really wrong with this group. These are the people that come in and do uh, the bulk work of the day. So they can be very, very um, important. But then the bottom part, 14% of employees are disengaged. Pot stirs, destroy relationships day in and day out. And the reality of, of what this Harvard Business Review really is trying to say is that 14%, and if you really think about your organization, you, your history um, working with people, that 14%, that's where you put most of your energy and your work. You're always watching to see what they do. You might have to give um, coaching lessons to them. You might be writing them up. You might always be hearing about problems that come up and always that person seems to be involved. They also are the ones that can take that 54%, which in a way might even be considered um, fence sitters, right? You know, right on the, they're sitting right on the fence, right in the middle, and they can pull people down to their side. In a strong culture, in a strong organization, that is a strong culture of guest engagement, of trying to have people that are engaged and positive and friendly, a culture should push those 14% out. A culture that doesn't have that really just continues to work with them and put all their energy there. Now look at the top, that 29% of employees that are energized and committed to their work. You're so busy with your job and then working with that lower percent that's always, always causing problems, always something wrong, you're always trying to get them better, that the 29%, oh, they're a joy to you because you don't have to worry about it which means you're not doing anything with them. You see them and you're like, hey, how are you doing? Oh, you got everything done? Great, that's fantastic. And then you go put your fires out. Well, those 14%, they're probably not going anywhere unless you kick them out, unless the culture really moves them out. So they don't have that many options. That top percent, that those top performers, your gold stars, they have other options. And if you don't put your time, your money, and your training, and just coaching, really just coaching them, you'll lose them. You'll eventually lose them. And when they go, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have anyone to really do this job. I guess I'll do it. And now you take on more work and you're still working with that 14% that's pulling you down. And eventually you're in a quagmire. So we really need to rethink and we have, um, we're not 100%, I'm not gonna say, you know, we have beaten it, but I will say it is something that we actively work on and have really changed our percentages here, though I'm just saying that I wish I knew exactly. I don't have numbers to do that, but I have seen such a change in the staffing here that, that this has really worked for us. But think of that, and you're all thinking the same thing, and you're all probably thinking, you know, what if you're the superstar and no one has really given you direction? Do you know a five-year plan? Do you know a, a one-year plan for your future career? Do you have stretch goals? Are you giving out stretch goals so people think they're going to go to the next level or that they're valued? I mean, people are more concerned, are more, they're more motivated, more motivated by praise, kind words, than they really are by money. Uh, you know, if you're gonna double their salary, the double salary is gonna motivate them. But if you're just talking about normal raises or bonuses or things like that, they help, but not really, not in the end. People want to be engaged. They want to have, that feel like they are gonna have a future with this company. So think of that, that's a great thing to take. If you don't all use it already, it is a great thing to talk about with your teams because I don't care who you are that does hit you over the head. And when you think about that 14%, you probably thought of a few names, you saw a few faces of those 14%. And, um, and that's just reality. Don't feel bad, it is, it is reality. So the selection process, we said to ourselves, the leadership, the people that were hiring, the people to do the reviews here, that we're going to have a commitment to talent. 
So when that talent comes here, when we hire them, we don't want them just to show up one day and say, here's your desk, here's a pen, here's your log on for your computer, enjoy your time with us. We have a specific orientation. We have onboarding, which is different. For us, orientation is the first day for everyone here, going through the same uh, orientation for history, HR, guest engagement, health and safety, uh, a tour of the gardens. Onboarding is when you then go to your team that you're actually gonna be working in and being trained, given the time and the energy to train them on their new job. Promise of training our culture and history completely and more fully as time goes on um, and a daily lineup. So we committed to this and if anything, we have doubled down on this commitment. We just hired um, in the last six months, a person, a, a new director, whose job is this. She's HR and her job is orientation, onboarding, training. Uh, I just started a, with 36 other uh, managers here, a two year Harvard online training program that we're going to be doing together that is mapped out for the next 24 months. Um, it's a big commitment, but uh, we believe that the talent here is worth that commitment. So the ex Guest Experience Academy goals, again, train all Longwood staff, students, and volunteers on our service goals and standards. And also after that, to maintain regular refresher courses for Longwood staff, um, and create onboarding staff within the different departments relating to service and to share our intellectual uh, capital with public gardens. So uh, just to give you an idea how orientation is looking in 2020 for us. So we have all our orientation. So brand new hires, orientation date set for all of 2020. We have the rooms booked, everything's done. For everyone hired new coming in their first day, they will be meted, meted. They will be met by a team member, hopefully their supervisor or one of their supervisors is gonna meet them with a box of everything they need in it. They need any shirts, that will be in there. Name badge, everything they are gonna need to do their job is gonna be in that box. The only thing they won't be able to do their first day for some reason I don't understand is have a login. We will create a login with them once they're here, that will go through IT and then they'll be able to log in. That's the only thing we don't have down to first day. Then that first day, they will go through an all day orientation, beginning with HR. Then they get me, guest services. I have a, a presentation on our, a, a brief um, presentation on what our expectations are for FaceTime with the guest. They have a safety and health history and then they are gonna go out with our, our best tour guides that we would say all our tour is a great a tour of the garden. So they really will be able to speak to the guest about what is out here in Longwood. Then there's a whole program that where they go and they are uh, gone through onboarding with their own teams to learn their job. About two weeks, approximately two weeks after that, all of those new hires are then going to go through uh, the academy that I'll show you at the end briefly, but it's an all day guest experience academy where we go over uh, our four steps of service, resolution, guests that may come here with different needs. And starting in April, we're going to end that with uh, a presentation on for which this is part of us, part of our uh, new five year strategic goal, but. Um, the best ways to interact with people from different cultures that speak different languages and the systems we have at this time. So that's what it's going to look like. So our goal is within your first month here, you'll not only have orientation and internal staff onboarding, but two weeks later, you will have the full all day class on our expectations, um, a full expectations of how we interact with the guest here so that we have unification of expectations. So that's a lot. I know I just said a lot in a very short amount of time. So we have 800 employees here. We also have 800 volunteers. 
Um, I have 200 volunteers that report to me uh, as guest engagement volunteers, and all of those volunteers wear the same name badge as everyone else here. We all wear a name badge, it has our name, and it might say what we do underneath. Theirs does, would say volunteer on it, though I don't know how many people actually notice that, but it's the exact same name badge. So 1,600 people wearing the same name badge. We don't want to skip volunteers. So we say volunteers are staff in that regard. So we train and onboard volunteers in the four steps of service in a resolution model. They have a two hour class to teach the basic guest service skills and standards to all volunteers. And because they are volunteers, we don't want to put the pressure on them to, to have the full expectations of resolution uh, as, a, as a staff would do. So really we teach them who to contact and we'll give them two options. We really pare this down uh, to who to contact should they need any help with anything. Um, and we want them to feel like they're part of the team. So they'll go through refreshers too. Um, we are incorporating any refresher that we have into any volunteer training and onboarding. Uh, and they get a weekly update of everything that's happening in the garden. Um, I write it for my 200, but we, the few of us that have massive amount of volunteers, we really take um, a core piece of information that comes out and then we disseminate it to our teams in a softer way. Uh, we don't wanna overwhelm them with too much information, but we wanna make them feel comfortable while they are here. Um, refresher courses. We have a refresher course in March. We are putting all 1,600 people through um, a refresher course on the international guest, how best to interact with people from different cultures, languages, without making anyone feel like they are other or different or a bother, anything like that. So the staff will go through a two hour refresher class on this. We call it a refresher though, really it is a new class. Um, and the volunteers are gonna go through a 45 minute version of that because we want, it's really how we speak to the guest. Are we thoughtful in what we say? And are we mindful of the differences of the people that come here? We strive to be one of the great gardens of the world. We want visitorship from everywhere. So we won't have to be prepared for visitors from everywhere that may have different needs and most of them truly are language based, but other things as well. And then growing this project, and I said this at the beginning, the budget for this is minimal. Um, it's systems that we've purchased over time to support this. That's really where the money has gone. Um, but we have put a lot of money into payroll and payroll, you know, it does certainly add up in the end. When we added up putting, we're putting 800, uh, 1600 people through this refresher course, 800 of whom we have to pay while they're here. Um, that adds up, but we feel that it's worth it. Uh, we also are going, we uh, make videos and, you know, we don't bring in video teams. We do them pretty much on hand. Uh, we've made plenty of videos here with iPhones, so trust me, we're not going high tech on all of these. Um, and we look at the five year budget expectations for us doing these things, and we come up with a payroll cost as well, but we also look at the return. So I started here in 2009, October of 2009, and that year we had 847,000 visitors. Two years later, we hit 1 million. Biggest, greatest thing that ever happened. This year we did 1.5 million. So within 10 years, we've gone from 847,000 visitors to 1.5 million. Now, we're not so arrogant to think that the only reason we've doubled, nearly doubled our visitorship is because we're nice to people, but we really do feel that it's part of it. That culture change where we really focus on the guest, that we can market to it, we can speak to it, we can show it we really do feel that that has been a part. Um, and if you look at our membership growth, I think that that first year um, we started, we had 14,000 member households and now we have 60,000 member households 
looking at like 125, 130,000 people in our membership program here. And we do really think that a lot of that has to do with not only our garden being beautiful, but the experience they have, the personal experience they have interacting with our staff gardeners um, as well. So making this program a first class success has required a lot of dedication and resources, a lot of human resources, to be honest. Um, and it's also been never forgetting the goal. This isn't something that after a few years, people just kind of thought, well, it's done, we can move on. It gets brought to the top of the discussion heap every year, every month. We talk about it all the time here because, and I will say this, creating a culture of guest service excellence is a journey, creating a guest service mentality. Any culture change is a journey. It didn't happen overnight. It's taken years and years, and we are still working on it. Um, and for us, it upholds our core values, professional leadership, but also fiscal alignment. Because if we were really pushing this, if you're pushing this in your own garden, I would really say that we believe building this culture of excellence and interaction will have fiscal, a positive fiscal effect on your garden. Thank you, Chuck, so much for um, such an informative session there. This is only the first part of your session, so we're going to do um, a quick Q&A, and then we'll take a short break. Um, we did have a couple questions come through. Uh, the first one was, how has selecting friendlier employees during interview and candidate kind of decisions impacted diversity of staff? Well, especially a staff in terms of language too. Is that what different speaking different languages? Is that the sure, yeah. so in our in our um, job descriptions when we put out different job descriptions, we added you know knowing a second language wasn't required but preferred. Um, when we started that, I, I can tell you, especially in the guest services department, when we added that, it was amazing how many people new second languages, they were coming forward. Um, we, we just, sometimes I'm surprised at the quality of, of, of people that we get here. We just hired a part-time staff person who has a PhD in botany, but is completely fluent in Korean, I'm sorry, Japanese, yeah, Japanese, Korean, and her English is still beautiful. So that has been, um, has been a positive effect for us the friendlier employees, you know in an interview within five minutes. You probably know in the first minute, but speaking with someone after a few minutes, some people come in a little shy um, and you could give them something, but realize people have about five to 10 seconds to make a first impression with a guest. So if it takes them two minutes to warm up, it can be difficult. So we have to teach them uh, clues on that, but um, I saw a change in horticulture. They hired, I remember we were just really starting to get into this. They were hiring some new full-time staff people. First guy they hired. Eight weeks later, he was doing presentations in the conservatory on orchids, orchid balls, how, to, how we create um, different things here all day long for an orchid extravaganza event that we had. And we had people that had been here five years that hadn't even thought about doing something like that. So we saw a change. And then the other, his peers saw him doing it. And before you know it, we had people doing it all over. We also created a year um, called Beyond the Garden Gate, where the entire summer was based on the staff giving presentations on what they did to, um, to our members. And all of a sudden, people that you would never have thought would be able to speak in front of the guests were talking about their passion and they had no problems. So um, we just see more and more of that building as we have really looked at that first impression, what first impression that they gave us during the interview, does that carry through? So we've had great success with it. And then as a follow-up to that first question, uh, during the interview process, how do you determine if someone is shy or nervous versus not friendly? So we, well, we make it a little hard. Uh, we, we have two to three people that interview each candidate, which is stressful. But what also is less stressful though, is 
They have different people asking them questions. We talk to them a little bit, we warm up. We tell them what we do first to give them, you know, give, give them a little introduction of who we are and what we're looking for, which gives them a minute or two to kind of relax and sit down. And you can tell other things right away. Do they walk in confidently and shake your hand? Do they come in and they just sit down? But I will say this, I, we've interviewed people that the first second when they walked in, you thought, oh, I'm not sure. They seem a little shy, but then they started talking and you realize they were fine. Maybe a little different. Maybe they're a little quirky. Maybe they're um, not the typical 101 star candidate that just walked in. But as soon as you got them talking quickly, you realize they were very interesting, that they were engaging and that they had a great personality. Not everybody's the same. We don't want that kind of a unity or conformity. Um, but I, I think that just takes a lot of time. We're getting ready uh, you know, for a hiring ramp. So we'll probably, my team will probably have about 50 interviews that we'll put in a couple, in, a, a, in about a two week time period. And when you do a lot of interviews, when you do more interviews, you do get a better read on this. I will also say, that with the best laid plans and you thought you've hired a great one, no one can hold that for more than three weeks or four weeks at a job. So we've all been fooled. We've all had someone that we thought was gonna be fantastic. And after a few weeks, their guard drops and they may not be who you thought. Um, we do have 90 day, you know, you have 45 days and 90 days uh, to decide that, that this person might not be the right one for you, you might need to use that. But I will say we, we have a really good um, rate here of, uh, of being on. Um, and I think there's a different energy from someone that's a bit shy and someone that's not friendly. But that's, I don't know how you quantify that, but um, I, I just feel that the energy is a little bit different. They try harder. People that are just shy, I feel, try a little bit harder than the people that are just not friendly. The ones that aren't friendly don't care. Uh, the, a shy one could certainly still care quite a bit. Are there more or less positions for staff that don't speak English as a first language? Hmm. I mean, we don't care if English isn't their first language if that makes sense. I'm not sure, quite sure if that's the question or not. Um, we have a fair amount of staff that English isn't their first language. Um, really, it comes down to their personality and their job skill at that point. If, if they are right for the job and they speak a second language, whether it's first or their second, uh, for us, that's all a bonus. Um, I don't know if we specific, we do not specifically hire that way but we do want to hire people from different cultures and different languages as much as possible. Do you want me to answer that? Okay. Uh, for Lauren, is a daily lineup by department? Um, no. So we all meet in the visitor center, which I will say is heavily guest experience. Uh, I guess uh, the guest services staff, security, operational services. The other departments send a representative. So marketing, I think what you do is you have a, you have a, a calendar and you put on the calendar and then you have a representative each week that will come to the lineup. That marketing then will tell us everything that they have going. If they're sending out a mail or if something is coming up, they will tell us then. And then if there's anything they need to know after a lineup, they go back to their team. So we'll have a rep from Hort, from um, facilities, performing arts, but not the whole team. Again, just the scope of the scale of Longwood is so big to have hundreds, we don't even have a spot big enough to have everybody come in every day, but we do it, we do it that way. But every, there's just the one lineup. Now I will say other departments might have their own. I know the restaurant has a lineup every day before they start their day. So that could be a secondary thing, but the one lineup is at 8.30 for everybody. And then people can go back and do something separate later. Okay, well, thank you, Chuck, um, for sharing with us and everyone for your fantastic questions so far. Uh, we're gonna take a quick five minute break 
And just a reminder, we've been getting some questions about um, having access to the recording of this. After the day is over, we are recording the entire webinar and we'll be sending out a link to that recording in the next few days. Um, so you will be able to go back over the entire day um, and revisit these sessions. And we'll talk to you in about five minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone for the final portion of today's webinar as Chuck steps us through along with Guest Experience Academy. All right, so this academy lasts about all day. So um, it does have a lunch, a half hour lunch. We don't give them a lot of break, uh, but it runs really about seven hours to do the whole thing. I do almost every academy, but I will say this, it is not just my voice. Uh, we have a couple of different people that will take parts. We interchange it. Um, it's just listening to one person talk all day. I don't, I don't care how good a speaker you are. Uh, you're going to bore them. Their, your voice will bore them. So we do try to mix it up. And to be a presenter, you we want them to be dynamic, interesting, but really also know uh, know everything uh, about this. Um, and this has changed. We've had different iterations of this over over the years. The beginning, the core part, really is um, unchanged in the messaging, but we've added and added and added more over time uh, it would be interesting uh brendan huggins i know he's on here he's at uh, bach tower he was an intern here in 2009 when i was here uh, just starting so it'd be interesting to have him come back and see uh, if our culture feels different to him uh, 10 years later so um, we might work that out uh, brendan i'll talk to you later so let's look at this and we're going to go through this quickly i know this is quick uh, but just to give you an idea of what the day look, looks like, what we talk about, um, and what we think is important. And this, what you're looking at now, is exactly what, um, slide for slide, what our staff sees. When they walk in, they're gonna come in and see the Guest Experience Academy. Hello and welcome. We do a meet and greet that's a little different. We have a ball with a million, with uh, 25 questions on it. We go outside and form a circle. Each, we each throw the ball underhand gently to each other and they have to answer a question wherever their thumb lands. Just a different way to have a meet and greet, not the let's go around the room and tell me a little about yourself, which most people would consider uh, to be a true torture. Even people that are extroverts, no one really likes that part. So it's kind of a different way to break up the greeting. Uh, when we sit, we have four people at each table. We want the max to be 20 at a time. That's why it's taken us a little while to get through everyone. Um, 24 would be the absolute max, but even at the table, we try to make sure that the people sitting next to each other are not sitting next to anyone from their own department. So when they leave here, they'll know someone, if they're guest services, they'll know someone from horticulture, someone from facilities, someone from people that, that are different, the ones they won't see all the time. And that kind of helps um, maintain, hopefully, friendships or ways to interact with other departments, which we think is very important here. Uh, we talk about our goals um, on guest engagement. We talk about our goals with people that may have extra needs or might be angry with us. <clears throat> and then we begin by talking about Longwood's legacy of hospitality through the steps of service. Um, this is something Pierre DuPont wrote that we like to start out with at the fundamental you know, the places to do everything that is attempted in a first class way. Paul says world class way, but he's really kept the same sentence. And that's our service philosophy, first class, world class. And we talk initially, and this has always been in here, who is the guest? And really the answer that we want is everybody, everybody's the guest. And we will talk some about the internal guest, which or with each other, the staff here and the volunteers, um, and also the external guests, those that come either as vendors to us or members or people that pay a ticket, uh, photographers, international guests, people that come to see the gardens in a different way. We have um, people that come to see concerts, performances, our organ, Caroline Steinways, our performers are also our guests. We've been doing an enormous amount of construction here lately. So Bancroft Construction, trust me, is uh, a guest, if not an in internal guest as well. But how do people 
interact with us. And then we also talk about uh, youth, the children, because we think of Longwood in perpetuity. We think of it not as something, I hope the next, here's what we're gonna do the next 20 years. When we redid our main fountain garden or the main fountain garden project, we talked about how that won't need another major rehaul for a century, but after that it will. And we think like that. We just assume our, our goal is that we will be here forever. And for that to happen, we really want to stress the importance of children as the next step, the next generation of visitors here at Longwood and as a place of learning uh, tours. <clears throat> and the guests experience the garden in a different way. But we want everyone here to have a seamless visit um, and to no one to ever feel that they are other or different. Um, our service philosophy, this is the marketing service philosophy. Marketing wrote this. The world is the community in which we serve. We embrace each guest by upholding our core values through acceptable service. That's really for us to tie in our core values into what we do here on a daily basis. And one of the things we want to do is to have exceptional service and to create an extraordinary guest experience. We have everybody take a few minutes um, at their table of four to think of a place that they'll never go back to and why. And you know, while Comcast and Verizon always seem to make a show, um, other places do come up and we talk about why, what happened. Um, and nine times out of 10, not only was it their expectations weren't met, but when they tried to get a resolution, they got nothing. They, they just felt like they were ignored um, and passed over. Then we talk about a place you will go back to, and that's all over the board, but we have found what people talk about is the place that makes them feel special, someone that remembers them, somewhere where they can go and see something that makes them feel comfortable or a person that they talk to, that they talked to once before, that is consistently friendly. Those are the type of things that we see um, over and over people talking about. And it's good for them to hear that at the table because it really clicks in and makes their job here at Longwood more of a reality because we're, they're saying, oh, that's what I like, so that's what I should do for the guests that come here. That's the tie-in uh, we shoot for. And we tell our guests that we want, uh, we tell our guests, we tell our staff about our 100% uh, satisfaction goal. You know, one question that we ask is, would you recommend Longwood Gardens to a uh, to a friend. And that has remained unchanged for years now at about 98%. Um, I mean, that's fantastic. There's no one that wouldn't want that. You know, we want 99, we want 100, but 98% really a consistent number of recommending us. Um, that really speaks a lot uh, when it comes to how guests feel about a place. Um, the model that we went over a little bit before, we, go, we review that with them. We talk about our core values and, and what it, how that um, works for them. If there's a number on the slide on the left at 0 0.02, that means that's a card. They get a, um, a booklet, a small book booklet. We don't do huge binders. We don't want them to write a lot. So this means that's there. They don't need to take those notes. They can listen and think because that's already there for them. Um, this is our... This is our way of talking about our six departments, our core values, our steps of service. For us, horticulture, education, and the art are the three-legged stool on which Longwood sits. It's really the core um, of who we are. Um, and then the guests, we speak about a guest-centric model, um, the guest-centric model here at Longwood. And then the four steps of service, delivering a genuine first impression, engaging the guest, exceeding their guest expectations in some way, and hopefully through that, cultivating loyalty. And then we go through, um, kind of, uh, we speak about each one separately. First impressions, what's important in the first impression? You have five seconds to make a first impression. So when you get here, have your head in the game, realize you are on property, you're on stage. If you want to think of Disney, the second you are on Longwood property, you represent Longwood. Eye contact, smile, um, proper uniform, name tag, dressing the way your, the supervisors ask you to dress, but always, always, always to have your name tag and open body language. And we discuss the differences between open body language and closed body language. We talk about smiling, but having dead eyes that aren't looking at anybody, shark attack, those type of things. 
to make it a little fun, but to make it real for them too, to have very clear expectations of what we want. Engaging with the guest, for us, we say it's not so much we want the staff to talk as much as we want to get the, the guest talking. So we could, you know, we have, yeah. Longwood is 1,083 acres, but really only 400 acres uh, is available to get to the guest on a daily basis. But that's still a lot of walking, you know, um, on an average day here, I walk eight to 10 miles going uh, to all the different spots. Um, a guest could easily walk three to five miles here in their visit, depending on how far out they go and how, how much really they explore the meadow. And if we tried to explain to every guest everything they could see, it would really take um, an, an exorbitant amount of time, especially with the visitorship that we have. So, you know, we do say one of the first things that a guest asks when they come out is, what should I see? Where should I go? And we want the staff to say, you know, to have some questions in their back pocket. Have you ever been here before? What were your favorite parts? What would you like to see? Um, what brought you here today? and to give the guest an idea um, of what might work best for them. Because we've told guests everything that they could see here. And they're like, can I see that in two hours? I'm on a tour bus. No, I give you a six hour tour. So a good question. Have you been here before? How much time do you have? What kind of things do you like? Just having some questions that they feel comfortable asking uh, really um, eases, takes the pressure off of people that especially might not be used to interacting with a guest every day. We let them know the tools they have, the internet, our website, maps, uh, the daily lineup. And then we always say have a cell phone and a pad of paper. Um, about probably a third of our staff uh, do carry radios all the time, but not everybody does. And if you don't, who can you contact easily? Only two cell phone, uh, two numbers that we recommend the staff to have, guest service um, desk and security desk. Those are the two we would want uh, our people to know about. We show them the, the lineup here. This is the, the daily events, everything that is going on in the garden today so that they can know what's gonna happen. And a lot of people, we will print out an actual lineup for the guests, uh, for the staff uh, during the day. Not everyone, we don't print out 400 a day, but some of the key people will have the lineup, especially the ones that we are placing in the garden. Uh, that we, in the garden, so that they can pull it out and, and that our volunteer desks throughout have a copy that we pl place each day so they can see. We also make a lot of videos and I am not going to play all the videos here. Will it work? Sorry, this is just beautiful. Everywhere you turn, there's something more spectacular than I would So that's a very basic 101 video, first impression, first engagement with the staff person. And we talk about what did you like here? What didn't you like? What would you add? What wouldn't you do? Uh, most people really like this one, though they want her to stand up. Um, though we do talk how she opened her body language. But we talk about what were the steps of service? Did you see the steps of service here? She had a great greeting. She smiled. She clearly heard the guest talk because she jumped into the conversation and mentioned, yes, it is a chrysanthemum. Uh, she told a little about herself, which we really do try to push. We don't push last names or anything like that, but we do like people to be proud of what they do here and let the guests know what they do. If they're a horticulturist, a student, uh, whatever that happens to be, 
let the let the guests know a little about yourself. And in this, she created herself or she set herself up as as an expert. So when you would come back to if you had more questions, and then the little kicker tease at the end, she says, if you like this, then you have to come back in a month to see our full mum display, our full chrysanthemum, and that is cultivating loyalty in the guest. You know, if we really give the guest a great experience, that will cultivate loyalty. But to really cultivate loyalty is to give them teasers to want to come back to see us later. During Christmas, when we're incredibly busy, if anyone's been here at Christmas time, um, we're busy. There's a lot of people. It can be crowded. Not everyone enjoys that. And if someone says, oh, I really don't like crowds, we say, you know what? Christmas is always busy. Outside is less busy. But you have to come back in February to see our, mom dis our, our, our orchid display in the conservatory. You'll have the place to yourself. It's quiet. It's relaxing. And it just gives people a reason to come back or times, other times to come back as well. But in that, we show the four steps of service um, in, a, in, a, in a way that seems easy, um, not too complicated and not too linear, not too step by step here we're doing, um, but something that guests, that the staff can feel comfortable. Um, we do a garden experience. Uh, when someone's lost, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, when we pass a guest that we ignore somebody that, uh, And then someone coming to save, to come with someone coming to save the day. And that's the first few videos. And then we watch a video. Um, it's how to connect with a guest in 90 seconds or less. Um, this is something we purchased um, from a person named Boothman. It's about a 30 minute video. They go through um, in a different way, four steps, the four steps of service, how to really engage with the guest, the importance of first impression and how you have very little time to really connect with the guest because our reality is most of the time when we are connected with the guest, it's a minute or two and, and that's it. And then they're off because they want to see the garden too. So we have to really make sure that we have a clear message in that time and that we actually help the guest with what they want in that time period. Um, it's funny but it's also um, pretty clear in, in its messaging. And then we talk about engaging with our guests. This is where great comes from. Do you guys remember that here? The great messaging. Um, and then we talk about um, trying to put it into play. So <clears throat> we have all the tables. There are four at each table. So they just kind of pair two and two. And I go, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this time going to take just a few minutes with the person next to you and you are going to interact with them like they're a guest. Ask these questions, find out things about them. Without fail, the hardest part of this is getting people to stop talking to each other. They get into it, they get engaged, and it's in a minute or two, they find out where they went to school, what they did, what their job is, who they are, little things about them, and it didn't take much time and it wasn't hard wasn't scary. Um, again, people that might not be extroverts don't like speaking in front of crowds, but one-on-one -on -one, almost always do fine. They like that and they certainly prefer that. Um, so this is just a little exercise on actually what it's like to talk to a guest because they tend not to know the person really sitting next to them. Um, we ask them, uh, not everybody, but we ask a few people if they learned anything interesting from the person with whom they were speaking. Um, and then we give those same type of questions that they could then ask a guest that just came up to them. Uh, when was the last time you visited Longwood? Um, are you visiting with anyone today? Where'd you travel from? What brought you to Longwood? How'd you find out? Just things to uh, get the conversation going because it makes it easier. Not everybody can think on their feet instantly. So this gives them some opening lines to, to start with. Um, and then we've given everybody a postcard that they have numbered one, two, and three, and then have their address on. And we have them write one thing at this point that they can do to create a first impression. Something that they can walk out from this class today and start doing. And it might be the simplest thing. It might be to make sure they greet every guest 
to smile at everyone that walks by. It can be very simple. And then uh, 60 days after this class, it will be mailed back to them, the three things that, we've, that they said they could easily do to see if they still do that. So we do hold them and we do uh, mail the postcard out 60 days after this. And then we start talking about exceeding the guest expectations. And you know, I said before, when we first started this, everyone had these huge grandiose things that they would do for every guest but they're simply not possible because you really have 90 seconds to two minutes in your interaction time with the guest to do something special. But there are little things that uh, people can do. Uh, look for clues. Um, you know, we say you can tell instantly if somebody's lost just by the way they're turning their head around trying to get oriented. If that, someone has a map open, we always walk up and say, how are you doing today? Can I help you find anything? Where are you? Uh, what have you seen so far? How much time do you have left? Reorient them. You can change their visit. You can say, oh, you know what? If you're going to the conservatory, we have a free walk, uh, free talk on the uh, um, water lilies today. You can't miss it. It's free. It's fantastic. Give them little things that can happen. Um, again, always take photos. The number of photos that we take here for guests can be mind numbing um, at Christmas time. If I put myself into one of the spots that I put volunteers or staff, um, I could take 300 photos we've, when we've counted in two hours. Um, it's just nonstop. Guests love it. And that's what we call that a memorable moment. Now they're going to go home. They have a picture of the whole family together in a beautiful spot. And we get comments on that all the time on our surveys. It's the only picture we have of the whole family. And invariably, there was something special happening that day. It was our, our parents' 50th wedding anniversary. It was grandma's 75th. It was the first time we've had the family together in five years. So we don't know all of that, but the little things we do really can add up easily and make a memorable moment for the guests. And memorable moments really help to build loyalty, a photo in someone's house of Longwood and the whole family really builds uh, loyalty. And then we ask them if they're guest ready and then we go into videos um, again. Um, I guess this one is. Good afternoon, um, I'm here. I would hmm? love to buy four tickets to the garden today. I'm here to see the Christmas show. We're sold out. You're sold out? Yeah, we've been sold out for weeks. I didn't know that. How am I supposed to know There's that? There's tons of signs on Route 1. We always sell out during Christmas. I don't travel on Route 1. I came back on 926 here. I didn't see the sign. You could have checked our website. We do update that. I've been here before at Christmas time and I've never had a problem. Well, it is a Saturday, so we're really busy on Saturdays. Saturdays? Oh. Yeah, we usually sell out on Saturdays. Oh, there's, there's four of us. Is there any way we can get into the garden? No. Sorry. Sorry? Yeah, there's no way. Can I speak to that? It's certainly not what I want to hear. I've been here many years in the past. I've never had a problem getting tickets. I've never had a problem getting in the garden. I don't understand. No, I'll see if I can get you somewhere. Hi. Hi. My name is Maggie. My name is Beth. Hi, Beth. Nice to meet you. What is this? The garden is sold out today. So, we're sold out right now. Uh, it's about 4 o'clock. We have tickets available starting at 8.30. 30? I have an older mother in the car and two grandchildren. I can't wait till 8.30 to get tickets to the car. So, uh, because it's so popular and it's so busy, we do have a limit on how many people we can put in the garden every half hour. So the next available time would be 8.30, but um, were you guys planning on having dinner or did you have any plans for um, seeking at Square or checking out no, anything there? No, just really we drove up here and we just wanted to see it all and we were going to have dinner on the way back. Oh, okay. So maybe, let's see if we can flip this around a little bit. So Kennet Square is absolutely beautiful. There's tons of restaurants, everything's set up for Christmas, everything is gorgeous. So maybe we can get you set up with reservations at one of the restaurants down in Kennet and we can sell you the ticket for 8.30. You can do dinner first and then come back here when the sun is totally down and those lights are gorgeous and we can get guys in to see the lights. That's really not what I wanted to hear. That is unacceptable. I, there must be somebody else that can give me a better idea of what I can do today. I want to get into the garden. That's all I want to do. And we can get you in at 8.30, um, but that would be the earliest time we'd be able to do that. 
I'm going to have to talk to my family. Okay, so um, my name is Maggie. Talk to your family. See what you want to do and then come back and see. I'll be right here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I love that video. It's uh, kind of our worst case scenario, but we found that if we just do happy, great, here's a great job videos, you really don't see what it's like when someone isn't friendly, when someone isn't hopeful. Uh, that person that kept saying, we're closed, we don't have anything, is actually the nicest person in the world. So it was very hard for her to make that video, but you can really see what does bad service look like? And does it make you uncomfortable? Well, good, it should make you uncomfortable. You're right for the job here if that makes you uncomfortable. Um, and then how we might deal uh, with resolution. And that's not always hard. And that for us is our worst case scenario. When we are sold out, we're maxed out. Um, we sell tickets by the half hour here, time tickets by the half hour here. Um, and if we are sold out, that means we're scanning a thousand people every half hour into the gardens and parking them. So uh, worst case scenario for us, but it's really good. It brings up some great conversations with uh, the team, with uh, the people going through this class on how can we do this better? Do we need to do it this way? Um, and it can be a learning for us as well. Uh, the good, the guest experience that we go through, um, issues where someone's like, they're mad at us, so they say they're gonna post on Facebook, social media issues, how we handle that here. Um, not gonna go through that, that was kind of scary. Uh, guest experience, someone with mobility issues. Here we go over two different things. Um, it's a mobility, people have a mobility issue and they need to get around and someone really not knowing the answer to something they absolutely should know and how that just makes the situation more awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and cultivating loyalty. What can we do to cultivate loyalty in our guests? Now we would say if we did the first three things right and the guard's beautiful and everything's clean and efficiently run and they got in quickly, that we uh, will cultivate loyalty that way. But what are the other things that we can do? Why are guests loyal to the gardens? Um, and we asked them as well, because uh, many of them have said they've been coming here for ever. They were brought here as children. Um, our, many of the staff we hire come, our members are a part of the membership. Um, and, and we talk about the little things and we also talk about what we say when someone's leaving the garden. You know, when someone first comes here, we say hi and we greet them and we're nice. When someone's leaving for the day, we want to make sure they leave with that good experience. Um, people tend to remember their approach, their start of a visit, and the end of a visit. Those things are, are always in the forefront of someone's memory of a place. And you could have a great visit throughout and mess up on the exit. So we're like, how was your visit? Did you have a good time? What was your favorite part? And when they talk about what their favorite part is, it usually can trigger someone's mind to say, well, if you liked this, then you should come back for this. You like the free concert? We have another organ concert coming up. We have an organ competition coming up. Um, whatever it might be, something to get them to come back. This class is not about selling memberships. So I will say that I do not at any point say, and then you should try to close the deal and sell memberships. We never say that. We don't talk about it here because we want, if someone is leaving and they want to become members. We want it to be just because the visit was so incredible. And our numbers, the numbers of family households that we have would really speak to the fact that that's working and it works for us. Uh, and then we talk about uh, uh, this, this little first impression, engage, exceed in loyalty to feel, you know, try to a little sappy, but uh, still a way to kind of tie it tie it in. We want the guests to feel something for Longwood and those are the four steps of service. It makes it easier for them to remember that. <clears throat> and then this is the, the end of the first part and we want them to know they understand the guest experience model, the steps of service and our service philosophy. So this is really just how we want people to engage with the guests, our expectations of, of the guest experience model as it's applied uh, real time in the gardens. And then we say, number two, what can you do today to either exceed the guest's expectations or cultivate loyalty? It can only be three or four words. They don't have much room to write on this postcard. So it has to be something very simple, very doable that they can walk out the door and do not only today, but every day and just make it part of, um, 
uh, their daily uh, their daily routine here. Um, and then we will take the lunch. We before lunch we ask them this question: Have you ever encountered a guest situation during your time at Longwood that you were not confident in solving? Um, and the reason we do that, we have scenarios that we are going to review with them that happen here at different times of year where uh, guests might not be happy or we might have to um, interact with the guests in something they love doing, but um, we don't want them to. You know, we have we planted a million tete-a-tetes in one area a couple of years ago by hand to come up in spring. Uh, springtime and we have found that the guests love to lay their children on top of it to take Instagram pictures. It's like their children are floating in daffodils. We've had people do snow angels in them. Anything you can think of that they're having a fantastic time, but we don't want them to do that. How do you handle that? So, but we want to see if they've, if they've had a situation different than what we're thinking that we might be able to help them with. They go to lunch um, and then they come back and then we do the second part, um, which is resolution or, or the guest experience of the gardens in different ways. Um, and we, we watch a video. Uh, it was, it was a, a made video for um, the retail industry uh, to make sure they're following all the um, ADA requirements, but also best systems or best practices to help someone that may have uh, different needs to make it seamless, as I said before, seamless and to not make anyone feel as if they are different or that they are other. Um, blind and low vision, cognitive and emotional, uh, deaf or hard of hearing, mobility, um, and people of short stature. That's a very short, uh, poor, uh, it's a very um, a quick way to go over all of this. But the video lasts again about a half an hour and then we talk about the five different uh, sections here. Still always remembering to deliver a genuine first impression, um, engaging with the guests, creating memorable moments, that there's nothing different um, in how our core values of interacting with each guest is. We watch the video and then we talk about what we learned during that time. And then we break it down into each section, blind and low vision, uh, visual cues, sight devices, the difference between a white cane and a white and red cane. White cane means someone has a visual, um, might have a visual impairment where white and red means it's both hair, hearing and visual. Service dogs, etiquette with service dogs. Um, cognitive and emotional, tone of voice, body language. Um, if they have a companion to interact with the companion, but not to forget the, the actual guests that, that we are interacting with. We never want to make someone feel like they're being ignored um, and speaking directly to that guest and maybe using a companion um, as a resource, but not as a sole, so, sole source of communication. Uh, people with mobility issues, we, what mobility devices do we have here for the guests? We have a near unlimited number of wheelchairs that are free to the guest. We also have scooters uh, that are free to the guests if they are able to uh, use them. Uh, we have family and caregivers that we can, uh, sometimes we have caregivers that we have a different ticket for them as well. Deaf and hard of hearing, uh, what is acceptable, unacceptable, contact, um, touching, trying to get someone's attention that might be hard of hearing, notepads, a cell phone tablet writing on your writing on your cell phone what are the easy easy things that anyone can do uh, to interact uh, to communicate with someone that may have a, be hard of hearing have a hearing loss um, this one is uh, not to um, it says you can get on your knees to talk to them but that seems we've all felt that to be uh, somewhat demeaning but to sit on a chair to not get too close and over and um, get too close and like look down to almost seem to overpower but step back far enough. Very simple things uh, there. And then the international guest. And this is the international guest. That part's not here yet. Um, that's going to be part. Uh, that's going to be part of the presentation 
come April. And that part is going to take at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, uh, to review with the guest at that time. So that's up and coming. That's the newest section. Uh, marketing actually has that now, and they are putting the perfect PowerPoint skin on it right now to match everything else. And then we talk about the toolbox. What does the staff have available to them today and every day here to best interact with the guest should they need anything? Uh, and that can also go to health as well, health and safety. And at th that, that's point two. So the tools are along with website, SharePoint, our internet, our daily lineups, a program of events. If we have any kind of event here, there is an SOE, a sequence event, a sequence of events for it that is broken down by, by 15 minute points. Uh, our garden maps, cell phones, longwood radios, um, and pen and paper. Just having, it can be so simple sometimes to have a pen and paper uh, to write things down for people. Our go-to team members, manager on duty. If we, if the gardens are open, we have a manager on duty. That's me, typically. I, my team runs the manager on duty. So if we are open uh, as site operations, our role is to make sure everything is running correctly. If it isn't running perfectly, we then contact the people to fix it. Uh, we also have any all guest interaction um, and should and, and direction. And should there be an issue with a guest, we are the ones that then uh, directly work to help resolve any issue that they may have. Um, on my team, I also have, if we're open, we have a guest engagement lead who runs a team from anywhere, depending on the day and what's going on, seven to 14 guest service associates. And we have our own radio channel, G-Serve Guest Services channel. So that's typically a team member's first go-to. If it's safety or health, someone's having, um, a health issue is public and safety, so security channel. And visitor center has, if you don't have a radio, you can call uh, the guest service desk and we make sure everyone has that number in their, in their uh, cell phone. And then the guest service desk could then radio uh, someone in the field to help them with any issues. So this is very important for um, all staff to know that they're not alone. We don't want people to think, okay, you've gone through this one day class and now you can handle any issue that happens to a guest by yourself, be it health, anger, or uh, uh, um, just guidance. So this is just a helpful hint so that take some of the pressure off so they don't get too overwhelmed with what the expectations are for their day. And then we talk about the it's on us mindset. If a guest truly had a thought that something was supposed to happen today, and it's not. I mean, we, again, we're a big place. We have a lot of things going on. There are days when things break. There are days when we cancel something because something else has come up, an event that maybe a guest wasn't aware of. Um, and that can really upset them because they came here for a specific thing. And we can always, you know, we do slightly joke that if a guest came here to see something that isn't working, they always drove three hours. So it's never two, it's never four. They've always driven three hours. Um, for that guest, we want to give them comp tickets. Our, my guest service leads, I mean, I do, my guest service leads all carry comp tickets so that they don't have to go through some long drawn out process to get them. But should someone not have get, uh, comp tickets, all we have to do is uh, let the desk know our, uh, a ticket ticketing desk know that we have a guest coming and can they have four tickets or two comps waiting and they'll just be waiting for them we don't put them we don't grill them to find out why we're giving them this it means someone else has talked to them that part's over and we just need to give them tickets at that time and we talk to them too we don't just like throw tickets in the air and then walk away and hope they're happy we really want to make sure that not only do we explain what happened and apologize certainly if we need to, but how they can make sure that should they come again, that nothing that they want to see is offline. Um, this is our guest resolution model. It looks, it looks complicated. In the center um, is the guest, so it's still guest centric. But what this, what we really talk about, and we talk about this a while, is that when we have a guest resolution, if we have an angry guest or we aren't happy with a guest, 
uh, with what they're doing, that we are still stepping back enough to, to still do the four steps of service, to still give a first impression, to introduce ourselves, try to speak to them, doing something, even if, especially if they're mad at us, we wanna do something to kind of turn that around, offer solutions, educate if we need it, it's garden etiquette, a garden safety, and uh, try to close that with the guest. If it's, sometimes it's just a conversation, uh, sometimes it's comp tickets. And then we also want formalized feedback because we don't want to keep making the same mistake. If a guest is upset about something, the MOD, I would need to know so we can go back and fix it. It could be uh, we don't have a sign out that we need. It could be we go back to marketing and say, can you put this on the front page we have on our the, the front page of our website, little things that will pop out about today right on the front website and marketing will say the Italian water gardens are off today for repair, but we have open air theater and the main fountain gardens running all day. Something so a guest won't be surprised, but that formalized feedback really helps reduce issues, uh, repeating themselves during the day, making more people angry than we need to. Uh, this is a much nicer video where she actually helps the guest. Um, and we talk about the guest resolution process. Here's really just a written process of the, the guest centric picture that you saw. It's the same thing, uh, making sure we have formalized feedback back to the guest. This is a video about a guest having a health emergency and how we handle that. Um, and how does, we talk then about, and Mark Rizla would love this part more, how does Longwood receive guest feedback? And just some interesting little data on feedback. 52% um, of people that are angry with an organization, statistically, never let that organization know. They could go certainly on social media um, and probably do, but they don't um, formalize that. They don't make the formal complaint with anyone that works at the organization. 43% communicate to an employee um, who may or may not do a darn thing about it. And they certainly are not in a position to make a difference. It would be like um, yelling at the person who's scanning your groceries at the grocery store at the cost of something. They didn't make the price. They're not going to tell anybody. You really just wasted your time. Only 5% people typically will make um, a registered complaint to management. Um, and that in no means means that management is then going to respond to them. We do say we do respond. We respond to the guest um, that's um, angry with us, upset with us, or confused about something. But those are just a typical um, statistics. Again, they can change a little bit year to year, but not much. Uh, but we say just because people aren't complaining to this, I'm speaking to the choir here, but um, how people communicate their displeasure with an organization on social media. And then we review again for a second time that staff here do not respond in any way to social media complaints. That goes to Marcom here, and they have their own system for um, handling that. So if I see something pop up on Facebook or social media, though they probably already know, uh, I'll let them know. But I would never respond on social media because that's handled in a different way. And you have your own people up. Uh, I'm looking at our, our marketing team. Our marketing team has their own people that handle that and message it in a specific way on social media. And we really want our staff to know, do not go on social media and be our defender. Never, never, never do it. It's like throwing an accelerant on a fire. It never makes it better. <clears throat> it's never made anything better. So we really want to stress that. And then we play a game. Uh, we take the different, um, we talk about the four steps of service, keeping your head in the game, we do a quick review, and then before the great work slide comes up, we give each table of four a scenario of a guest that is not happy with us. They have five minutes, we have all sorts of little props for them, and then they run up, and then they do um, a role play of how they think they would fix it in the garden. Some people play the angry guests, some people play staff, and then the other team rates them one to 10, kind of like, you know, Resolution Idol. And it's fun, everybody gets a $5 gift card to Wawa, for any of you that know what that means. Brandon, you know what that means. But 
Um, it's just a fun little game, but it's also good for them because then we talk about how they resolved it and the other teams will say, I probably would have added this or I wouldn't have said this. And it's a really good real time situation because they don't have a ton of time to think about it because in reality, um, they don't have a lot of time to think about it. Um, and then on their postcard, something they could do with the guest that seems unhappy or what they could do to um, help someone, whatever they want that they learned in this part that they feel that they can go forward and do. Then they have three points on their postcard. We collect these at the end of the day. Um, I just mailed a batch today from uh, people from a previous class. So we do mail them out, but we try to give at least two months to give them, give them a chance and almost maybe forget about what they wrote so they can get it back and see um, how, they, how they're doing. Are they doing what they said they were gonna do? And then kind of a, just a take action review, delivering the four steps of service, recognizing how guests experience the model, applying the guest resolution model, and feedback and our specific re responsibilities with the guest experience model. Um, in the new, starting in April, we are gonna go through scenarios from uh, that an outside um, consultant has made for us on people from different cultures. Uh, specifically, we'll, we'll, she'll, she'll come up with scenarios from different countries, just to give an idea of how um, things we do could be taken differently and how it's really, you know, we can't have everyone memorize every country and every culture, but best practices uh, to not offend someone from another country, another culture, or someone that speaks English um, as a second language. And that is our all day presentation in just a little under an hour. So I know that was a lot, but it just gives you an idea of what we do, where we are right now. Um, it used to be a two day class of four hours just on guest experience, uh, um, a positive four steps the first day and the resolution the second, but now we're doing all day adding the different parts. Um, so it's ever changing, ever moving forward. So I know that's a lot, but um, that's our, that's our, our, that's our academy. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chuck. Um, we do have some questions coming in, and we are getting a question about whether or not this training is available to other gardens. And um, our intention of the academy has always been to host outside organizations. So if anyone listening today is um, interested in that, we'll be happy to take down your contact information if you want to send it through to us. And um, we will be happy to contact you when we do relaunch externally. Um, so just something to note there. Um, some questions that are coming in, one from Liz, Chuck, about uh, what feeds the daily event module on SharePoint? So that is fed through the different departments. So it used to be we, have to, we used to have to go find everything. Now each department is responsible and each department has um, certain people that are required to do this. Any event coming up has to go on meeting room manager and programming. So meeting room manager, if they're gonna have an event here, they have to have a room for it. So first they would put it on meeting room manager, then they would put it on programming. What the event is, what are the requirements, what are the expectations? Once it goes on programming, they'll put a start and an end date on that programming, and th then it will pop up on SharePoint. It will also point up on, pull up on lineup the day of, it also pulls up on a different report. Every day, every week of the year, except for two weeks during Christmas, where we're just too busy and we're doing the same thing every day, we have um, an operations meeting at 2 p.m. on Wednesday. I've been here 10 years. It's been 2 p.m. Wednesday for 10 years. We go over every event that happened the week before, big or small, and then we go over in detail all the events coming up for the next two weeks, and then we talk about anything big that's happening um, really in the next four weeks. <clears throat> Anything too big, a person is directed to make sure that's on SharePoint. Our admins from each department, anything big that they have happening, the admins will put it on SharePoint so no one's surprised. 
Uh, we're doing um, tree shaping and trimming, trimming in the uh, idea, the, the um, Italian water garden for the next weeks. So shape the tilia, it's a big project. So that just popped up on SharePoint today. So it is fed from the different departments, but by the date that's put on it, that's how it shows up on SharePoint and our daily lineup. Um, Dustin, I said the formal assessment. You formally. So, do you want to read? Oh, go ahead. Uh, Dustin asks, outside of the informal assessments mentioned postcards role playing, do you formally assess uh, learning from the academy? We didn't much in the past, but with our new um, director of learning here, uh, she is going to start sending out surveys to uh, the staff after this. Um, and then the biggest assessment from the academy, I guess in many ways has been reviews because there's a section of the review that is completely based on how that person interacts with the guest. Um, and that's really up to their supervisor to, uh, to bring that forward. Uh, Lee Clipper, do you do this once per month? Basically, we do only because of the number of people, but we don't do it in our super busy time. So July, we just have too much going on. November, December, um, a, a fourth of our visitorship uh, for the year comes in the seven weeks of Christmas, our Christmas display. So we don't do it then. Um, at smaller gardens, it depends how many people you have. You know, we do 20 at a time. So for us, it's gonna, it takes forever to get everyone through. It took us forever to get everyone through. Um, but if your garden's smaller, you might be able to do departments or sections um, and get it done in a few months. So it, it might be very different. You would know you're hiring. So what you'd want to do is you, if you have certain times of the year where you do bring in a lot of people, so say maybe April, you have a lot of new staff, um, you would want to bring them in early enough for training, but also then to schedule um, one of these all, all day classes within two to four weeks of their actual hired date and orientation to have them go through all of this. That way you can give them a short orientation first and then within three to four weeks, they are gonna get the full, full class. And then added refreshers might be every other year for us where we get all staff in, but refreshers might have 125 people in. We're not trying to do um, 25 at a time, again, it's just absolutely impossible for us. Uh, Someone anonymous asks, do senior managers, directors, and other executives take the same training throughout the year? Absolutely. The first team to go through the Guest Experience Academy was uh, uh, our president, Paul, his senior team, and their leadership team, which came to rate about 2024. So they, uh, they will see the they'll see the class as kind of a beta class first all refreshers they get the first run but then they come to all of these as well because uh, they are now going to manage and review their staff based on these uh, refresher expectations or guest service expectations so they need to know as well as everyone else they are all expected to come and this goes back to buy-in you know if your senior team doesn't feel they need to go they haven't bought in because they would want to at least be seen by their team to know that they are part of it. Paul, when he's here, talks to the guests. If there's trash on the ground, he picks it up. No one here, there is not a person here who is high enough that they can walk by trash and not pick it up or doesn't talk to the guest. Um, and that comes down, that's culture. You know, Disney would say the same thing. Um, other places that really feel they have a strong culture would say the same thing. If you have people that feel, oh, at my level, I no longer have to do this, it's not part of culture. It is not a buy-in, and that's a really big problem. How do you record reasons for comp tickets? Oh, well, I'm not the database person, that's Renee, but it's pretty simple, really. Um, when they go in, they hit comp tickets, it'll say reason why, there's a drop-down menu for the main reasons, and some can be general, but there's also the button for others, should it be an unusual situation, they can go in and type the reason. Then when we run a report, those seven or eight drop-down menus will just come in and we'll just have a number, but we will then have the others 
listed separately to see if something weird has happened or if the same name shows up all the time if you're asking that too. Um, the majority of comps are recorded in that way, not 100%, but the majority are um, recorded that way um, at the, at the, at the um, ticketing booth. Uh, how does staff handle pets that are being represented as service animals? Um, I can only speak for Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, the only two questions you can ask someone who's bringing in an animal is, is this a service animal? And what service does it provide? Those are the only two legal questions we can ask. We do not ask both. If we want to know, we say, is this a service animal? If they say yes, we're done. And that's just the, the, the law. Um, people will come in um, without any kind of um, marking on the dog or you know, typically dog, of course, um, that they are a service animal, while many do. Um, but all they have to say is, yes, it is, and then we're done. So in the garden, if someone sees um, a dog or an animal, they're, they're not sure if it actually is a service animal, our answer is, if it has gone through the visitor center and the scanners, they've already been spoken to, and we're done. We are no longer going to talk to the guests. The only times we do speak to the guests is if they let the dogs off lead, uh, then we ask them to keep their dog on lead. We do have one guest here who has no arms and he has a Belgian Malinois who's trained uh, on voice to assist him. And clearly everyone knows that dog is as uh, the most trained thing in the world. But um, should anyone ask, I would just say he's been spoken to. He's a regular guest. Clearly he's fine. Um, but that's all you can do. I don't know what the laws are in different states, but I would bet that they are pretty similar to Pennsylvania's. And Chuck, if you want to create this kind of program at your own organization, what's the first step in doing so? We would say the first step would be a total buy-in from your president, CEO, director, whatever the top is, and the leadership team. And that message would have to come down from them, step one, or it's going to fail. I mean, I, I, I really am a big believer in that. Um, after that, I would do what we did. I would get a couple people from each department that you see that really are good at interacting with the guest, sit them down, meet, and discuss what did they do? Why did they do it? What kind of questions come up? And try to formalize it. And that's what we did. And I'll tell you, I mean, our first, our first run at it was pretty 101. It was pretty basic. But it spoke to um, it spoke to our staff because we didn't have the full time managers and directors creating it. Because let's be honest, where are directors and managers always? They're always in meetings. They really don't have the face time with the guests. So I would formalize what people do and make it simple. I mean, I'm from retail originally, so uh, there's a five steps of service. You know, greet, talk to them. Uh, sell them something, thank them for selling something, saying bye, and hope they come back. And it's pretty simple. Um, our four steps, just we wanted to make sure we took any notion of selling away that we are selling Longwood, if you think about it. Um, but I would keep it simple and start from there and then take it to another group of people in the garden and see if it makes sense to them. Try to present it. Keep it simple. Don't try to do too much at first. Uh, make your own videos that are based on your own garden and the experiences that you have there. Is there any reason you use the term guest versus visitor? Guest just, it's the idea of a guest in your home. It, it, it just the, the idea of making it a little more personal. I remember going back, whew, it's going back decades back to the William Sonoma Pottery Barn age um, when I was young and I worked there and I remember they made a video of people it was just, you didn't know what was happening. You just saw people going to a door and knocking on a door and they, the door just kind of opened up and they walked in and it was packed full of people at a big party and everybody was laughing and doing stuff, but they didn't know what was going on. And you just see them kind of walking around. It's uncomfortable. Um, 
and you feel the discomfort. Didn't even last two minutes. The next video was the exact same scenario, the same people walking to a door, knocking on the door, a friendly face opens the door. Welcome, let me grab your coats. Here are the drinks. Do you know Bob and Sue? Here's John and Mike. Do you know these people? And everybody's starting to interact, talking. And I said, would you ever have a guest, would you have a guest to your house and treat them the first way? Just hope they find everything else. Absolutely not. Well, don't treat them that way here. A visitor is just someone walking onto your property. A guest, you want to try to create a connection. So for us, that's why we say guest. Okay, well, thank you everyone for your questions. And once again, Chuck, thank you for your fantastic session. And with that, we come to the end of our Marketing and Communications Community e-conference. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please note that you'll be receiving a short survey via email tomorrow, asking about your experience with today's webinar. And you'll also be receiving a link to today's, to today's entire e-conference recording in the coming week. Thank you so much.